Why, hello. And hello to all of my beautiful Discord listeners. Today I'm wearing a very soft pastor's cardigan. Perhaps something a Calvinist pastor might wear. Perhaps someone, say, Peter McWilson might wear. I'm a humble pastor for the year of 2024. And that's because I have been so maligned, malignant by the internet for so many years as a mean man. I want to demonstrate to everyone that my ways have changed. I'm no longer a mean internet debate man, but I am in fact a very humble, pious, praying, lover of the Lord, Christian. In fact, I might even be the pastor of my own internet church. Perhaps you might all like to join and tithe immediately the maximum amount of tithes possible because I'm very pious, I'm very humble, I'm very loving, I'm very loving, I love you so much. I'm a pastor on the internet with a cardigan. It's Clark Griswold style, but it's a card again. I'm either a douchebag professor or a very humble past pastor man like FDR sitting by the fireside jets helping you to understand the word. In fact, I rolled in here on a wheelchair and it wasn't even necessary. I just did it to feel more humble. I can walk fine. This is the year of love, and don't worry. Pious pastor man Peter McWilson is here to help you on your journey. Just be sure to put a little extra in the gift box, if you know what I mean. In the tithe plate as it comes around. Brother Hensley in the mod chat will be passing the tithe plate around. Feel free. I'm going to be very humble to everybody today. Nobody will get their feelings hurt because it is the Western Papal Fake Christmas Eve, according to the Papal Apostate Antichrist calendar. (laughs) Merry Christmas to all your apostate heretics out there. I wish I could say I truly enjoy the season. But as a pious pastor man... It is my duty to warn you of these papal abominations known as the Western Calendar. So is it Christmas Eve? It's Christmas Eve for the millions of heretics out there that I want to help today. Truly, I hope that you will come share your disagreements and so we can find Peaceful fake reconciliation where we pretend to be friends but we passively aggressively still hate each other deep down from our hearts. Oh, did you think you were really going to get Cardigan Pastor Man? No. <laughs> you all got trolled. <laughs> no, you still get me. <laughs> <laughs> on papal christmas eve <laughs> a debate open to de- what the evil of this man how dare he choose to debate putting himself up as a pious pastor man in a cardigan and yet he wants to debate on papal christmas eve <laughs> Mean as ever. I'm still mean. I'm still mean. I still believe. I'm still mean. (laughs) It's going to be open for him. And you're not going to get pious pastor, man. You're going to get the same old mean, Jay. I was already mean to a Protestant this morning. 
and I feel good about it. I feel good about being me. Let me be me to your mom and your spleen. I said, I feel good about being me. I'm going to be me to your mom and your stepdad and your grandma and your cousin. It's going to be a mean Christmas Eve. You all fell for my troll and my joke that I was going to be loving. And it was all... Calling villain. Mobile. Calling villain? No. What the heck is happening? <clears throat> I said the word villain. And Siri thought I was telling her to call Villian, the Armenian dude in D.C. <laughs> Get out of here, Siri. And, and not Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> Shut up, Siri. Look at that. I'm being mean even to the robots. Thank you, Chase Haggard. The call-in lines are open. <clears throat> and uh, there's really no point in me rehearsing the rules because no one who calls in actually knows the rules or will follow the rules unless they ask questions. The people who ask questions follow the rules. The people who want to debate... His name is Velen, not Villain. So Siri thought I was talking about Velen. I said the word Villain. That was funny. <clears throat> the people that actually want to debate, of course, will not <clears throat> follow the rules. <clears throat> so we really, there's not any point in even rehearsing this, is there? I mean, we know what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to get repeating of my name many times. Uh, the delusional guy this morning at least didn't repeat my name. So I guess he gets one point for that. Carding and swag, baby. Carding and swag, baby. Mm -mm. I'm LARPing as a pastor man. But guess what? Every pastor's LARPing as a pastor man. <laughs> ah, the mean is coursing through my veins at the moment and I'm just loving it. I don't, I literally can't have a good day unless I've been mean to people. <coughs> don't worry though. I've come stacked with cough drops. <coughs> I'm, I'm prepared. We're going to open it up <coughs> so that people who claim they, that they would like to uh, debate can come on and say ridiculous things and I can lose my patience. <laughs> Just kidding. <coughs> You notice the last times that uh, people came on and said ridiculous things and within a few minutes of me determining that they're not rational people, I just simply exited the discussion. And yet they still said it was me. Not only was it mean to exit the discussion so that I didn't get angry. Every person I saw that I exited their discussion, then went on to Twitter to explain that the only reason I exited the discussion was because I couldn't answer their low tier questions. Mm -hmm, sure. So <clears throat> you keep telling yourself that. Keep telling, you. even though it's questions that have been answered probably a hundred times on the channel. Some some other guy was like, "Give me the video where you never did it." No, lazy. Use a search engine. I don't owe you anything. We've become so soft. Everyone is so soft and so... So passive aggressive. So I'm going to ask that Americans stop eating the diets they're eating. Because that's a huge part of it. America, stop eating your garbage diet it's making you all into soy men it's making your women grow peepees and it's making your men grow tatas please stop that's a big part of it so <clears throat> if you are interested you can call in and the way you call in is Twitter Spaces. And you can now call in on Twitter Spaces on a computer. It didn't used to be that way, but you can do it. So if you don't have the app, you do have to have Twitter. You simply join the space and you request to speak. We already have many people, 
many people already requesting to speak. Many beautiful, many beautiful parishioners in my humble online pastor's chapel ready to come and ask their questions so that I may give them helpful spiritual guidance as an online internet pastor so that they may then place their life savings and their memos life savings into the offering plate. Yes, we are very humble here so that we might build the Calvinist Cigar Club and golf course out back of the parish, even though we don't call it a parish in Calvinist churches. I'm very humble. Did y'all know? I may, in fact, hop, hop on the internet later tonight and tell everybody how much I'm praying and tweet how many prayers I'm praying. Every time I pray a prayer, I will tweet that prayer out. So that everyone may understand how much I'm praying publicly on the internet. Because Jesus himself said, when you pray, go into the widest spaces of the internet and tell everyone publicly that you're praying and fasting. That is what Jesus said to do. It's open forum. The topics are, as you can imagine, as you probably already know. Catholicism, papacy, history, contradictions, Protestantism, logic, laws of logic, uh, universals, logi, church fathers, councils, transcendental arguments, tag, atheism, agnosticism, empiricism, epistemology, metaphysics, Quran, philosophy, conspiracies, Bitcoin, geopolitics, feminism, of course, no one ever calls in on those topics, but they are open. The only requirement is please make arguments unless you have questions. An argument is not where you rap. I know that's hard for some of you slow boys and girls out there and slow wine moms. Rapping isn't an argument. You could theoretically rap your arguments. That is possible. I suppose if you are skilled enough... I will let you rap your argument at me. But slam poetry and rapping is not an argument itself. <clears throat> and I was going to un un <clears throat> unmute the guy that I had <laughs> the debate. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a debate. What would we call it? I don't even know what to call it. The brief discussion with this morning. Uh, but I can't remember his his handle. I blocked him at lightning speed. Everyone knows I'm a master lightning speed speed blocker. I probably block more people than uh, than there are blocks in Minecraft. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've blocked half of the internet, <laughs> and I don't. I'm happy I've done that. It's made my life a lot better. In fact, I wish that I'd learned to block people. Many years before I blocked the thousands of people I've already blocked. <clears throat> Someone once said, that's arrogant of you to block people. To which I say, 2024 will be the year of love and public humility displays. I will display my love and my humility nonstop all of 2024. I will tweet every prayer. And so that you can share my tweets and share with the world how humble and pious I am. It's very easy to get blocked by me. Just say one thing dumb. It's pretty much it. Like it's a, it's a low bar of what it is to qualify to be magnific magnificently blocked by me. Just to basically just say something dumb. And then we're, I'm out. It's over. Goodbye. So <clears throat> the way it works, as you guys know, and as you guys won't do, even though we know, we all know it and I'm saying it, but we all nobody's know, know nobody's going to do it. I'll give you the microphone. You can make whatever arguments you want. You can state whatever you want. That are actual arguments. We don't need to establish whether I'm a KGB, a Kabbalah, a wizard, sorcerer. We already know that. We already know I'm a Panamanian KGB operative drug lord assassin in a cardigan. So we can move past that. That's been established. Your expose. You, I concede you've exposed me. Now, what is your argument? Right? 
Maybe I should put vegans in there. Remember the vegans? I haven't seen them coming around in a long time. And they're an insane cult. <clears throat> so maybe the vegans can pop up. I forgot to put vegans in there. If you want to convince me of your atheist veganism, you can also do that as well. What is an open debate? You come on the Twitter space and I give you the microphone and you make whatever arguments you want. Where do you talk with people? What Twitter space. It is linked in the show description. It amazes me people don't know what the show description, like what the descriptions are on YouTube. It's like people don't have never even heard of this. Here, I'll put it in the chat for you. <clears throat> You're in the YouTube chat and you don't know what a show description is? Call in right there. Come on the Twitter space. That's how you, it's very simple. Is this whole audience boomer? I don't get it. <clears throat> All right, first up is James Lindsay lookalike. His name's Ricky. And by the way, if you get your feelings hurt that I make jokes, then don't come on if you get your feelings hurt. Because I make jokes about people's names, profiles. It's normal. It's, it's what guys do. So if you're super effeminate and you're going to get your feelings hurt about jokes, then just don't come on. Merry uh, Papal Christmas Eve, Jay. Mm. What's up with you? Yeah, so I was raised, uh, to give a little bit of context, raised Roman Catholic. And uh, in college, I got baptized in the uh, Church of Christ, uh, ICOC, ICC. Uh, cult, and then thanks to Sam you said, Stone. You said cult. Yeah, the ICOC Church of Christ. I don't. Is, is that's not the Campbellite Church of Christ, is it? What do you mean a cult? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the there's this ICOC uh, branch of the Church of Christ. Okay. And it's a pretty pretty massive cult. Um, but yeah, in the summer. Uh, thanks to Sam Shamoon, I kind of returned to Catholicism, and then I discovered you, and uh, inquiring into orthodoxy right now. And so, most of my debates have been with the Church of Christ people, and, and there's this one guy who argues that, uh, for the Episcopate that I try to argue for, he uses the Ethiopian eunuch as... An example of someone who wasn't joined to a physical church and he just went on his way uh, rejoicing, I guess. So what would you say to someone that uses that argument? Right, so Jesus says in Mark that when the guy's doing... <clears throat> can you mute your puppy dog side of things? Yeah, so Jesus says when the guy's casting out demons, right, in the book of Mark... This, the disciples say, but he's not amongst us. And Jesus says, there's no one who does a miracle in my name who will not who will <coughs> not eventually be amongst us. So I think the assumption is that just because in every situation in Acts, you don't see them immediately pointing out the Episcopate doesn't mean that that person didn't join the Episcopate. In fact, a couple times in Acts, they actually, when the missionaries find people like the disciples of John or the disciples of Apollo and Apollos, excuse me, Apollos, <clears throat> they tell them that they need to come into the church. So that's a unique time in the book of Acts when it's called the transition period, right? It's the inter, the inter, <clears throat> the, the, it's the, the period between the death of Christ and the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple is the definitive end of the old covenant administration. So there's going to be unnatural or abnormal or, um, maybe un unnatural is not, there's going to be, um, anomalous situ situations during that time period that won't be norm normative or they won't characterize the norm after the destruction of the temple. So once the church is established and the temple's destroyed, it's very clear that's supposed to be the definitive sign that the, that the kingdom has come and that it's no longer the Old Testament Jewish administration. So yeah, there were many people in the book of Acts who were reading the scriptures and coming to believe and may not have yet, you know, even met the apostles like you're talking about. But typically when they do meet the apostles, they are also instructed to come into the, to the church. And so I think the assumption is that the Ethiopian unit will come under the Episcopate. Um, and just because it doesn't immediately state that in that section, it's not like 
It's not like everybody can just go out and do what they want because other places in the scripture tell us that you can't do that. In the book of Timothy, for example, Paul says, I laid hands on you, Timothy. I gave the deposit of faith to you. You lay your hands on men after you who will be faithful. So Timothy is the only legitimate authority in Ephesus, not anybody else, not anyone running around doing whatever they want. So in other words, you can't, it's just like when Paul uh, decides out of pragmatic reasons to circumcise Timothy in the book of Acts. Technically, he doesn't need to do that, but it would be let, there would be less problems for him doing that with Timothy than if he hadn't done it, right? So we wouldn't take that one example like Judaizers do and say, well, look, Paul still circumcised Timothy, so you have to always continue to do circumcision. It was what he chose to do <clears throat> at that time in, the inter, in that inter-transitional period between the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the establishment of the church, Pentecost, and then the <clears throat> uh, destruction of the temple. So again, the key here is to understand the big picture of redemptive history. Not everything that happens in the book of Acts is normative for the entire history of the church because it's a transition period. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, a few more... By the way, don't the, don't the Church of Christ themselves think that all these things that happen in the book of Acts, like all these miracles and whatnot, that that's not, that doesn't happen anymore? Yeah, they're cessationists. In yeah, so, so they have their own position of, oh, well, we don't continue those things from the book of Acts till now. But then they're picking and choosing, oh, but this one we do, we want. We want that one because that goes against the historic church. Right, right. So... Uh, two more quick questions. Uh, when the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, would that be considered an energetic manifestation of the father? Yes. Okay. And uh, Now, <clears throat> each person in the triad is still involved in every action of God because every action of God is triadic. But the actions can still be unique to individual hypostases. So just like uh, Christ dying on the cross, right? That's a unique action. It's still triadic, but it's a un unique action that the son undergoes. The father and the spirit don't die on the cross or they don't experience death on the cross, right? Right. And yet the action is still triadic because the father sent the son to die on the cross, right? So likewise, <clears throat> it's not the... Uh, like actions are proper to the whole triad, but the actions can still be actualized by individual hypostases. Mm, right. Awesome. In other so, words, each person has a unique role in any action. Yeah, got that. All right, so final question. And I always love the argument you make about Nestorian sacramentology, which Protestants seem to have. So what's a good book on uh, sacramentology? I would just read something like <clears throat> um, Nicholas Cabasilos' book uh, on ortho basic Orthodox theology. <laughs> It'll give you a good Orthodox Christology, I mean, ecclesiology there and sacramentology. All right, awesome. I mean, most Thanks Orthodox so books kind of just tie everything together. They don't typically, unless you get into the academic stuff, they don't typically just write a book on sacraments or just a book on, because they all go together. Like our theology of the church is dependent on Christology. Our sacramentology is dependent upon Christology. Christology is dependent upon our Trinitarian theology. Right, yeah. I, I love that argument, and, and it's one that really got me to consider uh, orthodoxy because Catholicism, I just find it like really uh, all over the place when it comes to that, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. By the way, to the people in the chat that are saying Christmas is pagan, uh, that's idiotic, um, Christmas is the feast of Theophany, right? <clears throat> it's the, uh, excuse me, it's the, it's the birth of Christ, right? It's not the baptism of Christ. It's the, <clears throat> it's the feast of the uh, coming of the of, of our Savior into the world, and it has its origins in the Orthodox Church. It has nothing to do with Sol Invictus or anything like that, and that's why the traditional Orthodox date is January, right? It's in January, so. We'll be celebrating Christmas, uh, January, you know, six, seven, eight. We're not celebrating Christmas in the Orthodox Church typically uh, on the papal calendar. So the irony here is that 
all these dumb Protestants that are trying to make this argument uh, and evangelicals and whatever these people are <laughs> that Christmas is pagan. They're totally ignorant because they don't even know that Easter is Pascha in the Orthodox Church. Pascha is Passover, right? And uh, the date, the dates in the Orthodox Church has nothing to do with Sol Invictus or Tammuz or any of the bullshit you guys. You guys have no idea what you're talking about. So you can call in uh, all the Protestants that are asking these silly questions in ignorance. You're free to call in and make these arguments. But if you're just here to spam stuff, uh, then yeah. Celebrating Nativity in January doesn't even match up to the stupid pagan arguments that you're making. Christmas is pagan because December is stolen Invictus. <laughs> Fumbles. If you're not going to call in, then just you're just going to get booted. Nobody has time for your low IQ spamming, and you guys are just, you're not even you're just spamming crap into the chat anyway. Fumbles. Hello. Question. You're cutting out. This is your question. Sorry, hold on. Uh, uh, is that any better? <clears throat> Maybe. Try it. Okay. Uh, my first question is about the essence of God, like men related to absolute divine simplicity. Uh, that kind of stuff. Is um, is the unity of God, as in the monotheism, right? Because we believe one God, right? Is that the idea that if we get one God from three persons, is that rooted in the person of the father or the essence of that or the, the essence of all three of the persons? Right. So the monarchy of the father, which is what's expressed in the creed, we believe in one God, the father almighty, <clears throat> the source of that unity is the person of the father, but it's also, you can still, it's still correct to say that there's one, one God because there's one nature. Right. Okay. So what makes God one God is the person of the father. Yeah, and that he possesses a singular nature. I see. Okay. So, because I, I, for a long time, I thought it was the essence of God, and I was telling people that, <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, man, I might be wrong about that. I'll have to ask Well, just go that. watch Dr. Branson's lectures on the monarchy of the Father. And it's true to say this, that God is one because there's one nature, but that flows from the fact that there's one Father that communicates the nature. So... The creed itself, and even Paul, right? For us, there's one God, the Father of lights. From or James says, the the one God, the Father of lights. Paul says, for, for us, there's one God, the Father of Christ, right? So the terminology of Paul is the same as the terminology of the Nicene Creed, which is that there's one God because there's one Father. So that places personhood as the first category for which we know God. And Palamas says the exact same thing in the triads. So the essence is what the person has. And so it's true that the triad has one essence, but it's more true to say that there's one God because there's one Father, because that's the ancient Christian creed and that's the biblical theology. Right, and that's okay. why the Old Testament speaks that way. How does the Old Testament consistently speak of the one God as the Father? That one right. Father has sent his angel who has the name of Yahweh in him and who has a spirit. So it's more consistent with Old Testament theology than it is to say, as becomes really popular in uh, the medieval Latin West, to say that there's one God because there's one essence, and that one essence is Father, Son, and Spirit. No, there's one God because there's one Father. This is just the classic Cappadocian approach. Okay, I understand. So you can go watch uh, Dr. Branson's lectures. He has a whole series of lectures on his website on the monarchy of the Father. I saw somebody saying, oh, but the Ru Russian Orthodox calendar. Uh, yeah, the point is that <clears throat> the argument of the Protestants is that you're celebrating a day. You're doing these rituals to commemorate the birth of Tammuz. Okay. So it doesn't matter that it's still believed to be the end of December. The point is that they're saying that the celebration of the liturgy is pagan because you're celebrating the birth of Tammuz on December 24 or whatever. So thank you for your nitpicking um, when you're really just missing the whole point. By the way, wh wh why are you here to nitpick? Just nitpick somewhere else. Uh, you were nitpicking the other stream, so go nitpick some other stream. Hollywood, let's see, Hollywood, let's see. We gotta have somebody, 
we got the same people that always call in, not knocking you, Big Chief, but Kaiser Collins. That's an interesting name. Hello. What's up, man? I have read the scriptures. The scriptures revealed to me that you are the Antichrist sent to destroy the world. Is that a joke? No. I'm the Antichrist. Y yes. <laughs> is that is that why you're giggling in your thumb for an accent? <laughs> you can't even hold it together. If you're gonna troll. You can't giggle, dummy. That wasn't even the original guy that came on. Don, what's up? If you're gonna troll, make your jokes good. That wasn't even funny. Me, the Antichrist. Do you like my European accent? <laughs> Come on, dude. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Sorry, I'm a little bit sick, so forgive me. Hey, me too, man. That's why I'm eating cough drops. Oh, man, I'm just dying over here. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, so I'm a catechumen in the Orthodox Church. have been for about a year and a half. Hey, Jamie, could you make me a coffee? Go ahead, I'm listening. You, you've been a catechumen. <laughs> and... Um, I know I'm getting stuck up on some low level stuff, but one thing I'm getting stuck up on is kind of like a, this Marcionism train of thought where, you know, the Old Testament God was, uh, you know, an evil God. And then, you know, vice versa in the New Testament. So for someone who, not stupid, but I am a slow boy when it comes to this. So I kind of get caught up on okay, stuff. That's, like yeah, that. I understand. Now, I did a whole... Uh... I did a whole three hour stream just on this topic. So uh, I'm not trying to bypass the questions. I'm happy to um, respond to specifics and summarize here, but uh, I am going to link this three hour talk that I did on this topic because <clears throat> this is a, a, an issue that comes up a lot in um, Orthodox circles because a lot of people struggle with the Old Testament or something like that. And there's just sort of this assumption that well, God was a lot meaner in the Old Testament, but if you look in the New Testament, it's all peace, love, and hippie Jesus or something like that. But actually, every principle that you think about God having in the Old Testament that characterized him like being a warrior, uh, being involved in providentially sort of ordering historical battles, you know, this kind of stuff, it's all continued in the New Testament for the person of Christ. So in the apocalypse, for example, we see Christ as a conqueror who literally destroys his enemies. That's very much the idea present uh, in the Old Testament. For example, in the book of Revelation, we also see the principle of lex talionis invoked, eye for an eye, right? When the martyrs are praying, they pray for God's justice and vengeance upon those who persecute the church on earth. So again, that's eye for eye principles in the book of Revelation carried over into um, the New Testament. And, I mean, you can keep going through all kinds of things like the death penalty. The death penalty is very clearly continued over from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Paul in Romans 13 makes it clear that the state has the authority to put people to death. So, and, you know, people who disagree with that just have a problem with the Bible itself. They want to have their own ethic. They want to have pacifism. They want Marcionism to be true. I mean, you could go to uh, the very first apologetic work or systematic theology after Justin Martyr, I mean, obviously Justin Martyr is an apologist, but the first systematic theology in the in the history of the church is Irenaeus is against heresies. And in against heresies, Irenaeus is a giant section against Marcion. And he makes the very arguments I'm making that the God of the Old Testament is identified by Jesus in the Gospels multiple times over as being his father. And in fact, when we go back and read Exodus, when we read Exodus 3 and Exodus 23, we find out that it's Jesus that is the angel of the Lord that went before the Jews into the, to the promised land. So that means Jesus is the angel of the Lord who went before them to cleanse the promised land. It's Jesus who's the angel of the Lord that appears to Joshua before the battles. It's Jesus as the angel of the Lord that appears to the judges who go out and kill the enemies of God. So <laughs> all throughout the Old Testament, you have the identification of Jesus as the being doing all this. So the very idea that it's a different God in the New Testament 
is absolutely counter to the New Testament's argumentation itself. In fact, all throughout, this is the key argument, by the way, that I make against the Muslims. <clears throat> because over and over and over this comes up, because the Muslim assumption is that there's some sort of different, the, the, the Trinity and the deed of Christ are a New Testament invention. And that's why it's so important to stress and to demonstrate to the Muslims that, no, this is all throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Torah, right? And that's why it's such a powerful apologetic. But most of this rests on people's ignorance of the Torah. People don't know the Old Testament. They don't know the Torah. They don't know the law. They don't know the prophets. Um, and <coughs> I really like those texts. <laughs> so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into those texts. I've been into them. Even when I was a Protestant, <coughs> I was a Reconstructionist. And Reconstructionism is all about the Old Testament. So <clears throat> in God's providence, I guess it gave me, you know, a love for the Old Testament. And I'm not even saying I'm like, I'm the master of the Old Testament. There's people who know it way better than me. Sure. But the point is that <clears throat> the Old Testament very clearly teaches Yahweh has his angel messenger who is also divine and his spirit. This is like dozens of passages all throughout the Old Testament that have this structure and so, therefore, it's not a Unitarian theology. If it's not a Unitarian theology, then when the New Testament appeals to, for example, John 5 through John 9, Jesus says, I was on Mount Sinai. I'm the one that Moses talked to. That means Jesus gave the law to Moses. I'm the one who went before the Israelites. G Moses wrote about me. Abraham believed in me. That means Jesus is the one who went and ate with Abraham in Genesis. So <clears throat> we see then that Mar Marcionism can only rest on certain presuppositions like the idea <clears throat> that there's a different deity that's presented in the Old Testament and a different deity in the New Testament. And that's why Marcion is the first person to draw up a canon of scripture. Do you know the first canon in the history of the church of the Bible is actually Marcion's? And can you imagine what Marcion's canon was? Well, it's a bunch of gospels, sections, and he cut off like the synoptic gospels. And <clears throat> the odd part is that I think he left the gospel of John, which doesn't make any sense because the gospel of John is actually the one that most affirms the Old Testament. I mean, John 5 through 9 is like literally the destruction of Marcionism. <clears throat> and yet <clears throat> Marcion in, in his delusion included that. So, but there's other, by the way, there's other reasons why Marcionism had the view that it did. <clears throat> Marcionism is actually based on absolute divine simplicity, uh, all of the Radagawa's thesis, which most people don't know. But that required uh, God's goodness being smushed into his essence. And that meant that there could only be one kind of goodness at all times, according to Marcion, because of absolute divine simplicity. And so that meant that there couldn't be, in other words, he read it as if, there was a change in morals from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And since God is absolutely simple goodness, there could never be a, quote, change in morals. I'm not saying that God changes, and I'm not saying that there is a change in morals. That was Marcion's reasoning on the basis of actually his view of divine simplicity. So there's a lot of different errors involved in Marcionism. Uh, and a lot of Protestants who converted to Orthodox, who become priests and pastor, or excuse me, priests and, and teachers, they still retained a lot of their uh, Marcionite uh, higher critical presuppositions. For example, I did a video six or seven years ago about Father Stephen Freeman uh, as an example of this. I'm not trying to be mean or rude, but this is a fact. And I'm not calling him out. I don't know if he still holds these views. I've never talked to him. But <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that he consistently has argued over on his blog for many, many years at Ancient Faith Radio that the Old Testament God is a different God than the New Testament God. And he says, well, I learned all this in my Anglican uh, academic career. You know, nobody cares about your Anglican academic career. That should not come into orthodoxy. But that's the basis from which those people are arguing that it's a different God in the Old Testament. The ones that are in the Orthodox Church. I just, uh, it's kind of crazy. Like I wasn't raised Protestant or anything like that. But mm. that, that version of Christianity is so ingrained in my head and other people's heads, even though, you know, they weren't even raised like that. It's just, I don't know. It's just kind of there. And then people think a certain way. Cause you know, I get hung up with, uh, Oh, you know, this type of sacrifice and, uh, you know, God wanted him to kill that person. And it's just like, it's hard to let it go. Even though I don't even know where it came from. Yeah. I was raised Catholic, but even still, <clears throat> Well, but hard to let what go, because if when you get into the actual text, it doesn't present a different deity. 
right but then i guess my point is like my my moral relativism oh well then yeah that's the problem (laughs) right um you gotta gotta let that go exactly (laughs) i mean i appreciate Um, the honesty though (laughs) (laughs) um one more quick question are you still doing cardboard uh pretty much how do you how are you able to uh yeah because the fasts are made for men not men for the fast right so you get a dispensation or you talk to your spiritual father that's how um and we've done many talks on that uh let's see david reed what's up david reed David Reed, are you there? You gotta unmute, man. Come on, guys, you gotta unmute. <laughs> I, I I unmuted as soon as I saw him. <laughs> What's up, Jake? Hey. Um, I just had a quick question for you. I was listening in the Daniel Hukikachu debate, mm. and when he started asking about the incarnation. And does that constitute basically a change in the divine nature or did you, you know, he was making some kind of critique like that, um, kind of a normie yeah. Muslim critique. Right. And your response was that it was that basically the hypostasis of the sun entered into a new mode. Right. And I was just curious what you meant by mode. I've understood mode to mean like Michael Humer define substance i've heard him define a substance he said this is how analytic philosophy generally defines it no is that no that's okay, not what you're using it a different way right mode oh, and well, he was saying he was saying a substance was a thing with basically properties and a mode is a particular instance of a substance <clears throat> well so when we use a lot of terminology for theology that is from the patristic and medieval era. It's not the same thing as the way that these terms are used in modern analytical philosophy. So that's the first thing. Okay. For example, right. Per, right. person or hypostasis is not the same thing uh, as the way that we think of person in the modern world as just a guy over there, oh. right? Person has to do <laughs> with... I'm serious. I mean, so <clears throat> so specifically to, to talk about in, in, in patristic and medieval philosophy... The word mode, mode refers to the way a thing exists or how a thing exists. In in what way is that thing existing, right? So, for example, um, uh, thoughts, w- what ontological status do thoughts have or numbers? How do those exist? Well, numbers have a unique mode of existence that is not material. So they exist in an abstract mode. It's the type or the way that that thing exists. So when you talked about an instance, that would just be a particular. That would just be an instantiation. So <clears throat> when we talk about the sun, the sun existed from all eternity as the second person in the Godhead, right? He's the Logos. He is the eternally begotten offspring of the Father from all eternity as the second person of the Trinity. That's how he always existed. And he still exists as that. But there's a change in that he stepped into a new way of being that didn't compromise his prior way of being. It didn't shed his divinity. It didn't empty out his divinity. But if you look at the passage in Philippians, when it talks about kenosis, it says that he willingly stepped into our mode of being. And that means that he willingly chose to not exercise all of the powers that he possesses. So for example, in some way, because God is above time and space and creation, the second person of the Godhead and not the Father and not the Spirit were able to enter into the mode of being that we possess as humans. So he became man. He became flesh. He, the second person of the Godhead, adopted and took on impersonal human nature. It couldn't be a personal human nature because if it was, there would be two persons because there's already a divine person. That's Nestorianism, the idea that there's a dual subject in Christ. So what he assumed was manhood or human nature and the divine person of the son is the person to that human nature that he assumed but he did step into a new mode of being without compromising his divinity or his sonship so what do we mean when we say that there was a kenosis or something unique here well the the thing that the muslims aren't grasping is that god has the ability to be in time and space in a unique way 
that doesn't compromise or isn't identical to his omnipresence. And we see this, for example, already in the Old Testament theophanies. So the theophanies are all proofs of orthodoxy as well as proofs of the incarnation because they're unique manifestations of God himself in time and space. This is where the essence energy distinction comes in because how is that possible if God's absolutely simple outside of time and space? The manifestation is fully divine, but it's not equivalent to his divine essence. So there's a personal presence of God in an energetic way that still hides and still guards the unknowable essence of God. And so when the Son becomes incarnate, much like in the instances of him appearing in the Old Testament theophanies as the angel of the Lord, when he becomes incarnate, the difference here between Old Testament theophanies and the incarnation is that now he's appearing in human nature, in a fully human body, will, mind, and soul. Not a human person. Not a human hypostasis. So as he's present in that mode, <clears throat> he willingly limited some of his attributes. Does that mean that he lost his deity? It means he he exercises his energies as he wills. Same principle with creation. God didn't have to create. He willed to create. Stop spamming the chat. Good grief. <clears throat> Guys, please just, just mute these people spamming stuff. Just block these people spamming stuff. All right, so, <clears throat> so, so let me, uh, last point here. So mode of being just refers to stepping into a new state. And that doesn't require that the previous state, uh, it, that his substance itself underwent change. So he's not changing the existing nature. He's adopting a new nature. So that's the difference here. And so it's like the, the analogy that Athanasius and some of the Eastern fathers make is that imagine it's like a man putting on a, a cloak, right? Putting on a cloak does not change the existing human nature that put the cloak on. And so they actually will, Athanasius likens the human nature to like a cloak. Doesn't mean that the human nature is just a cloak and that it's, it's like a, that it's not fully human. It's just making an analogy to, to help explain that the adding of the new thing doesn't alter or change the previous nature because God was never bound to actualize every one of his powers. God could have created a universe without a moon. God could have created a universe without Thomas Aquinas, right? He has that potentiality, that power, but he didn't do that, did he? No, he created this universe. So God doesn't have to exercise all of his powers at once. So when Jesus was present walking around in a body in a new mode of being, the son of God is present in a new mode of being as a man. When he's walking around in Jerusalem, he's uniquely present in Jerusalem in a way that he's not present in Capernaum or in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So, how is that, though? Because isn't he omniscient? Yes. So both things are true. He's omniscient and present everywhere in one mode via his uh, omniscience. But there's a unique mode and presence that's not identical to the omniscience. That's a special presence, like the Theophanies were special presences, in Jerusalem. So both things are true at once. And all the arguments that you're talking about from like Muslims and people like that, that's all based on dialectics. It's either or. Either he's present everywhere in, a, in, a, in an absolute way, or he's present nowhere. And by the way, Muslims don't believe God is present in time and space. <clears throat> well, it's interesting because you'll hear, I hear these arguments most commonly among social Trinitarians that are evangelicals. Um, they kind of make these same similar arguments, meaning... You mean uh, that, Muslims? Well, basically that... This, this constitutes a change. It must constitute a change. Because if if the sun goes from not incarnate to incarnate, that's a change. That's, uh, he is now... In, yeah, that's, that's why the church... Fa that's, that's why I said substantial change. So it just depends on what you mean by change. Yeah, entering into a, sure. mo entering into a new mode of being is a kind of change. It is not a substantial change. And that's the terminology that many of the church fathers use, right? He underwent... Uh, he became man and, and yet underwent no change is the phraseology of Maximus. Right, right. And what would <coughs> constitute a subst substantial change? A change to the essence or substance of God. Substance is equivalent to essence. So if, um, sorry, I'm just trying to think about like the... Again, the, the, analogy, of putting on a, the analogy of putting on a coat. My human nature didn't change when I put on a coat. I added a new nature... So some kind of change occurred, but it wasn't a substantial right. change. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. As long as that's, I see, because maybe what's being targeted to is largely the absolute divine simplicity, maybe. 
Is that why this is well, such it's an part, angle? Because it's part they would <coughs> deny that he could even be in time at all. Right. Right. That would be part of the argument. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those those critiques rely on a reductionist view of God's uh, properties or traits, and they'll they'll say that every property or trait is basically just God. But right. no, we don't believe that. Right. I mean, we don't just believe in essence energy distinction. We also believe in a nature person distinction. Right. So, would that be a personal change? Is that is that appropriate to say that the the hypostasis can change? The divine hypostasis that is no, they don't. They no, they don't change. change. I am God, and I I do not change. There's none like me. God Himself says He does not undergo change. So, so what's changing? So again, do you understand? Things can change in different ways. Yeah, yeah, but I'm asking, what is changing? Is my question. The mode of being. Okay. Um, From not being incarnate to being incarnate. So who's what's go, undergoing the change? The second person of the Godhead is adopting human nature, taking on, adding a new nature. Right. That doesn't change so his essence. I'm not saying essence. I'm saying person. Yeah, like yeah but I when I, I know that, but what, so hold on. <clears throat> it's... <laughs> Him becoming incarnate still doesn't change his personhood, right, in itself, right? That's why we say that he underwent no change. He is a reference to person. Person equals he. Right. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, he right. underwent no right. change. When I put on a coat, do I no longer become Jay because I have a coat on? Does my nature or my person, I'm not Jay anymore because I got a coat on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Like, basically the... <sighs> The unsubstantial is referring to both the person and the substance, basically. Like, that's, it, it doesn't count as a, like, significant change, maybe. Well, I would, that again, would yeah, I mean, it just depends on how you define significant, because it is significant that he went from not being incarnate and from, and right. what Philippians calls kenosis. So he uh, emptied himself in the sense of, limiting and choosing not to exercise every possible power that he could right i mean for example when jesus is going to one of the villages and he says that says that he could not heal them there because of their lack of faith is that because he ha he didn't have omnipotence no it's because he willed to be in a state where he would make his miracles contingent in that case upon their faith right sure so he willed to limit himself. That's what Philippians is talking about in certain ways and in certain and in, and in the exercising of certain powers. For example, could could Jesus have destroyed the world when he was walking around uh, on on the planet if he wanted to? Sure. Okay. So he cho he chose not to. He willed to limit the power of conflagration at that time. Right. Right. So <clears throat> that's the what the meaning of the kenosis is in Philippians. It's that it's based on the essence center distinction. It's based on God not being absolutely strictly speaking pure actuality in his essence right so there is an essence energy distinction which means that you can't collapse them in the pure actuality doctrine of, sure. of thomas okay. aquinas okay i'll move over off that at point for now I'll, I'll, I'll look at more that's helpful that's yes helpful sir yeah great questions great. great questions thank um, you and then i'm sorry i thought you were done i didn't mean to boot you feel free to come back into the quay if you want to but really good questions gato Sup, Jay? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Mm hmm Hello. Good yeah. afternoon. Yeah. So, uh, uh, very, very quick uh, question. I've been lately in some low-tier debates with some uh, communists and uh, people with materialist uh, background, and I was trying to demonstrate to them that um, even communism has some metaphysical uh, foundations. Sure. So... Um, what is the best way to show that secularism is not uh, devoid of uh, metaphysics? But um, I don't want a long answer. Just, just you know, one, two, three points uh, that I could uh, make. Uh, I could start my argument with, like to show them that secularism, for example, <laughs> is uh, it has metaphysical foundations, and maybe that we can view it even uh, as religion. I show one uh, great. Um, uh, one great stream you did with Father Deacon and Ananias is science religion. Yeah, here's two easy things, right? So the first first thing you can point out is <clears throat> ask them, you know, any time that they state what is the case. For example, a lot of a lot of atheists, or excuse me, a lot of communists will say that they believe in 
either dialectical materialism or dialectical uh, or uh, uh, historical materialism, right? That's the two main metaphysical principles of communism. And if you ask them, like, well, th those are statements about, you know, th this is basically metaphysics borrowed from Hegel. Every communist believes in some Hegelian thing that they've adopted into either historical materialism or dialectical materialism. That's the two metaphysical principles of all communists that exist that I know of. <clears throat> and, and those are metaphysical positions. So you simply have to ask them, how do you know that all of reality is in historical uh, uh <clears throat> flux working towards something or uh, a dialectical flux working towards something diamat or histmat because those are metaphysical claims and if they won't admit like with that idiot Haas that those are metaphysical claims where they're making universal claims about what exists and what doesn't exist then you're dealing with a stupid person and there's nothing there's nothing you can do and then the other thing I would say is uh, another way to approach this debate is the critique that I did last night uh, or whenever it was two nights ago of the, um, the debate between, uh, Alex O'Connor and, and Ben Shapiro, because every communist who ends up saying that they believe in some form of dialectical materialism, um, needs to, if, if, if they believe in free will, then they are already in the domain of metaphysics and they're going to have to give an account of the will and its freedom. Those are metaphysical. That's the meta domain of metaphysics. And if they don't, if they want to admit that, then you're dealing with stupid people that it's not worth wasting your time on. Thanks for the <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. You're dealing with uh, dishonest people. So the Kaiser wants to come back. Uh, he's the guy I clicked earlier and we got the troll, but let's see if maybe I'll click the right person this time. <clears throat> Good afternoon, James. Doing yes, a PRD session. There's a little lag always. How you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, I was calling. I, we, you and I had a conversation the other day about the papacy changing doctrine, and I was arguing that they never changed their doctrine because it's always just been kiss the papal feet and just <laughs> right. what he said. Right. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, and I was and you were talking about the certitude, and the, when you put politics up as one of the, as one of the uh, possible talking point it occurred to me that i i was thinking to myself like perhaps the only real certitude to really offered is political certitude in the sense of when you look at the, the liberation of uh christian lands from muslims obviously the Ottoman empire the majority of those people the majority of those nations doing that were catholic nations and it seems to me that there is some merit to that argument but it still doesn't apply theologically at all which is, should be the main domain of the papacy but even when you see the papacy going around the world, uh, Pope Francis went around the world, he didn't mention religion really at all. He just talked about politics the whole time. So, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is an old critique that when the papacy took on this, you know, dictatus pape, Gregorian reform era, uh, you know, Franco papal, and then Borgia papal, when they became a geopolitical world power, that this really enmeshed them in putting politics first. And so this is why we get, you know, in the last century, uh, so much CIA interaction with the papacy throughout the Cold War. I mean, John Paul was meeting with Kissinger and, you know, Colby and, excuse me, not, not Colby, the other one. Uh, I always get these, those two mixed up. The other CIA, uh, um, the, the, the trad cat CIA head during Reagan era, right? John Paul was meeting with these people all the time because it was essentially a geopolitical power. And, and religion and theology, I would argue, became second way long ago. I think I'd agree with that. I think that's a, that was just something that came to my mind as a way to kind of explain, because what do people always bring up is the, the earthly aspects of the religion, and oh, it's successful in this way, or what? Appealing to the masses of people, whatever they want to believe doesn't matter when the theology is relevant. But I don't really think the papacy has ever done that, or really focused on that aspect of its religion. I mean, it's, most of the main accomplishments you find in the papacy are almost all political. Uh, I guess the other thing I, I just, just on, I agree with on that one. Um, the other thing I was going to bring up is I, I've been kind of, there's a big movement, obviously, now to almost, I feel like, recontextualize Protestantism as like this deeply conservative.
Oh, I know what it is. Hold on. Okay, I found it. All right, so, so yeah, you were talking about the papacy being. Um, a G I'm just catching the, the chat up. Well, and basically, he was making the point that, that the papacy is kind of a, a committed geopolitical institution that, that's led to a lot of corruption. And basically, the only accomplishments that they've ever had in the last uh, uh, few centuries or in the last thousand years has largely been a lot of geopolitical accomplishments. Yes, that's true. And then uh, you were saying, well, why do so many Protestants whose denominations are only five or ten years old lay claim to having this, quote, traditional idea of morality? And I was saying, well, the Protestants are just ignorant for the most part. But there's also NGO and foundation and government influence in Protestant churches as well. And this is a lot bigger than people think. I think this has really been overlooked. The Ukraine, deba the Ukraine debacle has been a big window into how the deep state, how the State Department, how the CIA how the Jesuits and all these entities are really um, instrumental in influencing what's happening in that sphere religiously for the behest of Uncle Sam and the Anglo-American establishment. So in the same way, I think that if you go back to like 10, 15 years ago, remember the emergent church movement? I was, I went, uh, this was several years ago, but I remember reading about, well, who's behind this? Like who decided, who decided that there's just suddenly this emergent church in the Protestant world out of nowhere? And that was all dreamt up and created by think tanks and social engineering groups. So you bet the, <laughs> the um, what should we call it? Sort of like a, uh, 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 it's not even a shadow government because they're, they're not hidden. It's in the public, right? Go ahead. No, I say absolutely. They're not even in the, they're pretty blatant with their manipulations openly at this point. I mean, the Ukrainian uh, government is throwing Orthodox priests into gulags and God doing God knows what to them right now, openly, and being and being praised by Protestants and Catholics and also and, uh, some Orthodox people as well. It's rather insane. Sure. Yeah, I mean, hasn't the <coughs> state always wanted to control the church? Absolutely. I mean, this is literally the whole history of <coughs> the iconoclasm controversy is. <clears throat> the state trying to control the church. All right, let's see. Um, who's next? Playoff. What's up, Playoff? Jamie Russell, Christian Middle Earth. Either you come to the VC and stop spamming the chat or you're going to be booted. So you're not the first person in the history of the world to deal with this metaphysical problem. It's been dealt with for 2,000 years in the history of the church. So either come on and chat or just leave. Playoff, what's up, dude? Hey, man, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Testing, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Good deal, man. Hey, I uh, just wanted to hop on here. I've been following you for probably the better part of a year now. Uh, love all your commentary and, and all that stuff. And so, Thank you. anyways, I'm, I'm a recent Catholic convert myself. I was a Protestant for 28 years, you know, one of those, I guess, non-denominational types. And uh, love hearing you talk about, you know, just religion you know, from many different aspects. But I was curious to get some commentary from you on um, where you think the source of misrepresentation of the catholic church comes from and just so i'm clear i'm not coming from an angle that the catholic church is this 2000 year old perfect being that has never had you know any mistakes or anything like that fully aware there's some things that go on that are not great uh, as in a lot of places but to me there seems to be a, a deep-seated misrepresentation that even kids from a very early age are being taught things uh, that are just plain not true about the catholic church as well as the orthodox church and so would love to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I guess it's a combination of, of different things. So it wouldn't be like one simple answer as to why. I mean, does the mainstream media or the education system sometimes lie about the Roman Catholic Church? Sure. But that doesn't mean that that vindicates the Roman Catholic Church because it's opposed by the mainstream media, right? I mean, for example, mainstream media, uh, mainstream education, they oppose a lot of um, fundamentalist Protestant church churches and sects. Does that make the Protestant churches and sects true because 
the lefties and people like that oppose them. No, it has nothing to do with whether it's true or false, right? So you can't take things that are indicators. Uh, in other words, the truth, you, you could say the true faith will be persecuted, but the fact that there's persecution going on doesn't mean that necessarily you have the true faith. That's just one of the things that will happen in the true faith. It doesn't automatically become an indicator of the true faith because there's perse Every group's persecuted somewhere, right? Doesn't the Chinese government persecute certain dis dissidents? Well, does that make the dissident group true because the Chinese government persecutes or what? No, that's a, that's a fallacy, right? So, um, so I think that that does occur, like where you have people in the mainstream media that they don't know anything about theology or in mainstream academia or whatever. They don't really care about the theology. They just see the Roman Catholic Church as this institution that symbolizes or represents the Bible and Christianity and all of its supposed, uh, you know, uh, colonizing or whatever their nonsense is, is, is based on, right? So that, that's that's part of it. But also a part of it is that, that maybe they legitimately are right that the Roman Catholic Church and the institution of the papacy became a giant uh, organized crime structure that fosters and funds all kinds of nonsense and, and that their criticisms are correct. I mean, people are freaking out about Francis. It's like all this stuff has already been in the papacy for a long time. So what are you talking about? Francis is just making stuff more public. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree on the Francis criticism. I don't think he's brought anything new to the table uh, that if you followed any of the other popes and, and what they kind of preach, you know, is, is materially different. I think where I was going with it, though, is more so on <clears throat> the belief systems versus, uh, you know, Catholics and Protestants. It seems like... Um, that there's just like almost a boot camp out there that's anti-Catholic and we're going to teach you things that are just, you know, not true about the church to almost get you in our church. And my experience in, in, the, in Catholicism has been, and again, this is just my experience, we don't really care about what you're doing at your church. Here's what we do. Um, here's why we think it's correct. You know, we're not here to really We'll, we'll, we'll talk and we'll have discussion, but we're not here to disprove what you're doing or tear you down or anything like that. And that was a really positive aspect uh, that kind of drew me in. All right. Well, man, that might have just been your local experience <laughs> of Catholicism. So, I mean, Roman Catholicism is what you want to make it, and it's all over the place. I mean, Roman Catholicism at the time of Urban II was we need to call a mil military crusade to fight Islam. Uh, Roman Catholicism, according to Benedict and Francis, is that you can go pray in the mosques with the Muslims towards Mecca. So you tell me which of those is the real Roman Catholicism. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about the history to comment one way or another. <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, history has a has a tendency of changing people's minds. And then to your, the first part of your comment just there, you know, from what I do know, I think there was some Christian persecution by, you know, Islamic people back then. And maybe that's why uh, there was some. Oh, I agree. Know, well, and whatnot, I, I agree with that. But that that's not the point. <laughs> the point is not, can you give a justification for the Crusades? The point is that the papacy now goes in and prays towards Mecca in mosques with other Muslims. Right, because Christians are still being persecuted today. And, you know, no, uh, the Roman Catholic no, Church is no. not being... No, do you not know that? I'm not trying to be mean to you, but do you understand that that's a fundamental rejection of the Christian faith? That Christians are being persecuted? No, tonight? come on, man. I'm I'm be, I'm trying really hard not to get mad. Explain further. To pray in a mosque towards Mecca. Ah, okay, I see what you're saying. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. I was jumping ahead a few steps. Uh, yeah, I I would agree with your statement. Okay, and that works how? How does that make sense? I don't think it does. <laughs> well, that might be a source of why people are mad at the Roman Catholic Church. Legitimately. So maybe it's not all one-sided. Like, oh, it's all the libtards are lying and they're creating Protestant groups to boot camps to come after Catholics. Maybe the Roman Catholic Church has do is doing things that legitimize a lot of the criticism. And that doesn't make the Protestant goobers correct. Yeah, I don't think it vindicates one side or the other. All right, so, I mean, look, 
it can't be true in 1928 that it's apostasy to pray in other groups meetings right and then now it's the work of the Holy Spirit hello I guess he left hey sorry about that I got a call look how can it be true in 1928 that it's apostasy to pray with other faiths and other religions together in a liturgical setting and by the 1960s and up until now, it's now the work of the Holy Spirit to do the very thing that was apostasy. How can that be true? It's a fair criticism. Not a uh, criticism, it's a contradiction. The only, I guess, parallel I could draw to it, again, this is me only being Catholic for about a year now, is, you know, before Vatican II, there were no masses conducted in anything but Latin. And, you know, that's a fundamental part of, of the faith that changed. And so I'm not saying that that means, oh, everything can change and everything is subject to change, but that's the only frame of reference I would have on that. Well, first of all, the language that the liturgy is celebrated in is not a fundamental of the faith that's unchanging. Well, unless you wanted to argue that Pius V at the time of Trent argued that you could never change the Latin mass. But, I mean, if, from an Orthodox perspective, it's always supposed to be in the vernacular. I mean, <laughs> that, but the point is that the Roman Catholic Church is unchanging in faith and morals. And praying together with others in apostate heretics, heretical groups is a moral failure that puts you outside of the Roman Catholic Church. In your canon law, that's an action of apostasy that removes you from the body of the church. So it's not just saying that any kind of change, we're talking about changes in morals. For example, the death penalty was always seen as a part of natural justice in the traditional Roman Catholic moral theology. And Francis says we don't do it anymore. It's changed. So we're not just talking about any kinds of changes at all. Everybody will admit there are some kinds of changes. We're talking about fundamental moral natural law changes and changes that now were a pot. Something can't be apostasy from the faith in 1928 and be morally good now. How could apostasy flip to be good? Right. Yep. I'm definitely going to dig into that more. Yeah, read more Mortalium Animos of Pope Pius XI from 1928. So I'm not trying to be mean. Just <clears throat> when you make these points, if I feel like somebody is going off into some other thing and ignoring what is the point. You've got to call them back to it. And that's just always how we are. Not being mean to you, man. <coughs> I'm eating my <coughs> cough drops. You got When you go down to the bottom of the Q, the Q, the Q, whatever, and you got the people with no, with no profile picture, that's like usually the most crazy uh, trollers. So Coco Ben, uh, looks like he's got no profile pic, weird name. So I, I feel like I got a troll. We need a little troll to break the to break the spell here. What I say? What did I say? I can do. I am I not good at spotting the trolls? He's on here playing his trying to learn. He's trying to trying to learn Black Sabbath riffs, right? Da, 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 da. Dude, like, wouldn't it be so funny if, like, I got on his stream and, like, what if I was practicing bass? Or, like, what if I was practicing, like, my Black Sabbath wrist? Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Ha, 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 we got him, dude! <laughs> Anytime it's the name at the very bottom <coughs> with no profile picture and just a bunch of gibberish, it's going to be a troll. Called it! Look, we got another one, too. Let's see if this is a troll. Laith. <laughs> What's up, Jay? I'm not a troll. <laughs> I know I don't have a profile pic. Mm. What's up, man? Um, yeah, so I left uh, Islam pretty recently. I'm going through catechism in the Orthodox Church. I just had a like a simple question. Okay. Um, I haven't gotten any answers about it. Um, okay. So about like self-defense in times of war, what is the Orthodox Church's standing on, like if you were to go serve in the army to defend a country? Yeah, the traditional stance uh, is outlined in the 
recent Russian church uh, statement on the relationships of church and state and social teaching. Uh, and you absolutely have a right and a duty to defend your homeland. And it's a virtuous action of love to do so. And that would include defending your family. And anybody else who says otherwise is lying or they are subverters. Okay. Yeah. No, And that makes sense because, you know, personally, um, so like my mom is a Protestant Christian, but she interprets where Jesus says uh, those who fight by the sword shall die by the sword. I'm probably butchering that, but... Yeah, that's talking about people who want to live a criminal lifestyle. That's talking about people like, you know, mobsters who want to commit themselves to living a gang lifestyle. And the point is that live by the sword, die by the sword, right? It's not yeah. talking about whether it's always wrong to be a soldier. In fact, this debate came up at the time of Nicaea because there were uh, errant Christians in the first three centuries who were trying to tell people that you couldn't be saved if you'd been in the military or if you were in the Roman military. And the Council of Nicaea said in the canons, there's nothing inherently wrong with being in the military if you're a soldier. <clears throat> it's, and, and so there's nothing inherently wrong with any of that. And uh, it's, it's Marcionism and people misunderstanding and not putting what Jesus is saying into context with everything else he says. Because in another verse, he tells them to go grab a sword. Sell your cloaks yeah. and buy a sword. So, yeah, and, that, and I was confused about that too. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. That was to fulfill the prophecy. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, people like to just, I don't know, from the outside, it looks like Christianity is like a pacifistic religion. This is how I personally, I used to interpret it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a legitimate criticism because in the last yeah. uh, two, three centuries, you know, Protestantism is this de degenerating, devolving thing that does turn into pacifism and it's a legitimate criticism because as we were arguing er earlier with the Marcionite guy or the guy attempted Mar like Marcionism is the same pacifist emasculating tendency. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I don't know where people just assume that that's what Christianity is all about. Not knowing history, not knowing the old Testament. And if you look at the history of the church, there have been countless warrior saints, countless kings who were saints who went to battle, uh, countless. There were uh, entire brigades of soldiers in the Byzantine Empire named after different saints. And so yeah. people are just lying because a lot of people want to turn the church into a tool for NGO and geopolitical powers. And that's why people like out of Fordham and all the lib, lib, lib idiots, they push pacifism and Skittles. It all goes together. Because they want to change Christianity, they want to change the church into what they want it to be as a tool of the State Department, as a tool, and, and and it's not an accident that Francis did the exact same thing to say the death penalty is no longer viable. It's contrary to the gospel. Again, Roman Catholics, clear as day, change. Stop lying when you say there's no changes. Francis says the death penalty is against the gospel. Mm. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that yeah, that's fascinating, man. Uh, and it's good to know. I mean, uh, when I first started coming into orthodoxy, learning about the church, because personally, when I used to go back and forth with my mom, I thought, I don't know if I'll ever become like a Protestant. Like, yeah. you know, they stand in church and, you know, it's, it's kind of like a concert. And then the preacher kind of gives like a, you know, like a, a, I don't know. It just <laughs> nothing felt religious or traditional. So, um but yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a feel good self help lecture is basically what Protestants yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you left Islam, and uh, that's good to hear. Praise God for that. Glad you're in an Orthodox church. Yeah, you just have to watch out because uh, you know there are unfortunately you know sections of the Orthodox world that are liberal too, and they're going to try to tell you that. I mean, I've heard all kinds of stories. I, I've myself seen people tell me in the Orthodox churches at times, oh, the Old Testament God's a different God. I was told that in 2007 is part of the reason I didn't become Orthodox. So it's so fundamentally stupid and that they're telling me that Marcionism is the true Orthodox position. I'm like, dude, I've read against heresies. I read it back in the 2000s. I know there's a giant section refuting Marcionism and you guys, Orthodox people, oh, we follow, we love Irenaeus, so Irenaeus. You don't love Irenaeus. You're a liar. You're contradicting a giant section of the book, which says Marcion is a heretic. Meanwhile, you're telling me there's an Old Testament God's a different God. Josh. Hey, Jay. Uh, I was just wondering on your website, uh, your Orthodox study Bible, 
isn't uh, connected for a hyperlink. I was wondering if you could fix that or suggest one. Yeah, are you talking about in the book section or on the main page? Because it's not on the main page anymore. It's on your uh, book section. Uh, it should go to Amazon. Does it not go to Amazon? Because that's the only place no. you could get it. <laughs> no, I. Uh, it just says the link's broken. Okay, well, I'll try to fix that. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you uh, have a thing for Book of Enoch. What do you mean a thing? Do, like, do like I have a, do uh, I have a love? Uh, like, do I, am I secretly attracted to it? Do I have a thing for it? No, no like, uh, like just something to like learn more about it. Like a suggestion. <coughs> um, I haven't gone into depth uh, on it. I mean, Jamie did a podcast on it, um, but they were just kind of looking at the contents of it. But, um, I mean, I, I did a podcast years ago about Nephilim and all that. So. But I don't really okay. have I don't really have any anything specific to the Book of Enoch though. <clears throat> Good question there. Um, maybe I should do a I should do a thing on the Book of Enoch eventually. Hey Jamie, could you make me one more coffee? Thank you. <clears throat> <coughs> Shout out to everybody on uh, Papal Christmas Eve. Uh, by the way, I've just been joking and trolling. There's all these the Spurgs in my chat are always trying to correct every little thing like. Uh, this is not, this is this technically is blah 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 and I'm like I'm just joking man it's just jokes okay and yes I know that there are Orthodox churches on the Western calendar I, I, yeah it's a joke man <clears throat> we got a lot of people in line <coughs> but that's okay I got a lot of cough drops so let's see Austin no I gotta pick a name that sounds like that they're ready to talk smack beyond polarity <clears throat> then that's that sounds like a dude that's ready to set you straight on philosophy hey what's up can you hear me okay yes sir all right thanks uh, for the opportunity to chat about this stuff because it's very interesting and I, I like to uh do a lot of research and think about it <clears throat> okay things like this um yeah about marcion um it's funny to to consider whether or not um, you know God is consistent through the Old and the New Testament, it's uh, it's an interesting question, and you know I'd like to I like to remember <clears throat> that the part where um, you know Jesus is talking to a bunch of people, and then there's these kids that come, and he looks at the kids, and they're like, "No, get away," and the kid goes, "You're uh, you're ugly," and then he like summons these bears, and the bears slaughter the children. You talking about that's not Jesus. <laughs> that's you're talking about Elijah, right? Oh yeah, that's right. <clears throat> that that's right. That would be silly if if Jesus instead of saying let the children come had them slaughtered. Oh, <clears throat> oh, he he put a trap on me, right? Because he he thinks. Have you looked at any of the exegesis of that passage? Um, I've I've looked at um, a lot of the scriptures mm. and. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I just want to talk to you without uh, going through, you know, theological lingo, just like rational and realism. Like, how do you, you're uh, Orthodox Catholic, uh -huh. is that true? Right. Okay, who for you has um, authority on truth? Like, where do you get your truth from? Uh, ultimately, it would be divine revelation. So that would be the totality, the deposit of faith committed to scriptures and to the tradition of the church. Okay, but you're you're making um, a lot of crit critiques about the church, right? About the, the Roman Catholic Church, about the Orthodox Church. So, sure, but how I, does that that do, that doesn't negate the position? Well, I'm just trying to understand how you come to your conclusions. Like, if I am going to be aligned with truth, should I just like follow everything that you believe? No, you follow whether the arguments are solid or not, right? So you're okay. confusing me with the arguments. So no, it's not about following me. It's who has the better argument. Okay. So then it's, it's more about like us and our, our logic and reason rather than the, the, the scriptures and the tradition. Well, I don't believe that the logic and reasoning is out of accord with scriptures. I think that the scriptures are them. I think divine revelation is itself the basis and the grounding for how we can have logic and reasoning at all. Okay, but you you also were critiquing people that take the Bible as like the foundation. Is it? Do you believe that it's? No, I was God critiquing people that believe the Bible alone is a foundation. That's the Protestant view. <clears throat> okay, I got you. 
so it's the tradition. So the uh, both. how many popes, like where did it go off the rails in your opinion? Uh, well, I mean, the Orthodox Church uh, dates the schism to 1054 officially, but the Roman Catholic Church dogmatically teaches error at the Council of Lyons in 1274. Okay. So in that case, um, I mean, back back then, before that, that rift, do you think that everything that the church was doing was good and that we should go back to that? Well, you say everything that the church was doing because the church is a lot of people. So everybody in the church is, I mean, people individually make mistakes, but we don't I, think... I'm not talking about individual people. I mean, just like the church is... You said everything and everybody, so... Well, let me just, let me tell you what I mean. I'm, I mean... The church, what they espoused, the the higher the, the head of the church, what the doctrine was. Well, we're not popes, so we don't have a head of the church. I'm not asking. I, I'm not saying you're the head of the church. I'm just asking. No, you, we don't like, believe that there's heads of the church. There's not a. We're not papists. Okay. So you're saying what the head of the church does is bad, and I was like, there is no head of the church. Okay. What's what's the difference in the rift? What is the main rift about? the role of the Pope and the doctrine of the filioque. Okay, so what what went wrong in your opinion? The papacy became lustful for worldly power and over many centuries conceded more and more to grasping at worldly power and by eventually, say, 11th, 12th century, the Gregorian reforms, they pretty much de- proclaimed themselves to be uh, god emperors if you look at something like Dictatus Pape in 1274. So that's, I think, the root of it is pride uh, and and uh, grasping for geopolitical power. Fair enough. <clears throat> and you, were, you mentioned earlier capital punishment. And uh, if I recall correctly, the church was burning a lot of people. Uh, do you think that was a good thing? Yeah, so you're talking about the Spanish Inquisition, which burned a couple thousand people in the midi in the late Middle Ages in the West, because that didn't happen in the Orthodox Church. Okay, so before 1000, they didn't burn anybody at the stake. No. Okay, interesting. And so your authority comes from a different. So where does your authority come from? So you've asked me about my position. What's your position? Um, yeah, it's, it's evolved over time. Um, basically, I the first thing that kind of like woke me up spiritually, I would say, was Jesus' teachings, right? The Gospels. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's repeated throughout, you know, is the love of the truth. And that always resonated with me, so... So what about when Jesus identifies, what about when Jesus identifies himself as the one who's the God of the Old Testament? How does that fit with, how does that fit with your argument earlier about Elisha, which you mixed up with Jesus? Uh, Well, tell me where he says that, um, in in which uh, gospel and, and which. uh... So, so you're spiritually awakened by the teachings of Christ, but you're not aware of any places in the gospels where he identifies himself as the God of the Old Testament. I want to hear your argument. I'm familiar. I just don't know like where you stand, what you believe. Well, okay. John, John five through nine, he identifies himself as the God at Mount Sinai talking to Moses and as the God of Abraham who ate with him. Okay. So, well, I, I don't take every scripture and every word as inerrant. Right. So it's ad hoc. It's the places that you don't like you throw out. That's called ad hoc, right? Well, I mean, Yeah, yeah, that's how the church is. Right, it's ad hoc. Yeah, sorry. So I like that you admit you're ad hoc. No, I I cherry pick. Everybody cherry picks. You cherry pick. How did I cherry pick? Everybody cherry picks. I don't don't think everybody. I don't, but you're just asserting that. What's your proof that everyone cherry picks? Where did I cherry pick? If you're going to give a sermon, you're going to choose scriptures. There are that's so not the same thing as cherry picking. Do you, I mean, is, do you know is. what you're talking you're, about? You're choosing what you're going to talk about. And what you're that's not, not the about. same thing as cherry picking inconsistently to ad hoc create a position. Those are two different things. Look, again, I'm telling you my position, my loyalty is to the truth. If okay, what is the ever, truth? And it, you said it's ad hoc picking the scriptures you like and don't like? That's not truth. It's outside of you and me and our thoughts. Okay, what is it? God, God it, it, it is God. Your truth is God. Okay, how do you know that it's God and not your delusion? 
it, it, that's a great question. It's something that we're all aspiring towards and we're working on. Okay. But so how do we, how do we judge between, so between my position and your position, how do we judge between what's true and what's false? Which gospels were written uh, last? Now, I don't gospels think you have any written? idea at all what you're talking about at all. Okay. Like literally you no idea question? what you're talking about. Which gospel was written last? Uh, what, you, what scholars are you relying on for the dating? Okay, that's fine None, if you don't no. know. It's John. And John I, I know what scholars, but I, I, I want to know how you know that. You're saying that. How do you know that? I'm, I, mean, I, I, went to, I, I know what scholarship says about the Daniels of the Gospels, right? I, I know that they think John is okay. alive, right? So do you think it is or not? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't even think it's relevant to this true. question because that has nothing to do with whether you know it's true or false and how you know which things to choose. That's the question. I'm, I'm asking an epistemic question. Yeah, yeah, and I'm trying to elaborate on, on why. I okay, think, but uh, you're you're relying on things that don't answer that. You're saying, well, the dating of the gospel, what, what does the dating of it have to do with how you know which parts are true and false? What's the epistemic okay. principle? Here's, here's the logic on it, right? Uh, let me elaborate. So you have four gospels written at different times. Most uh, credible scholars... Are I asked you an epistemic question. I'm, I'm getting to no, you're not. You're no, you, I don't think you even understand what that is. You're just telling me questions that don't answer the epistemic. You're answering with things that don't answer the epistemic question. You don't know what I'm answering because you're not allowing me It's to not speak. an answer because I can already tell where you're going. You're talking about okay. most scholars. Okay. That's the, you. When you cite most scholars as your next sentence. Incredible scholars. Who's <laughs> begging the Do you understand what begging the question is? Yeah. How do you know you've chosen the right scholars? Yeah, how do you know, right? We're at the same point. That's a two-quoque. I'm asking you the (laughs) questions. I already answered. So fallacy, fallacy, fallacy. Can you stop with the fallacies? I I just would like you to have... What is the... I know, and I'm asking a specific question about epistemic principle as to how you know what you're choosing. What is that? And you said the scholars that are reliable... (laughs) Begs, that's not an epistemic question. So I can just... You understand? I can just say the scholars that I like. Does it, would you accept that? Reason. Hey, logic and reason. That's what you do too. You, th- you think I just sit here and say logic and reason. So the, the response is said. just to say logic and reason. Wait, that's what you said. Oh my gosh. Are, are you serious? That's how you determine what, which, can which, we help you in some way? Like, is there a facility mm-hmm. nearby that we could help you to? Do you even understand the questions? <laughs> what Do you know what an yeah. epistemic question is? I what do, is that even? Yeah. What, what is saying, that? The, the principle of believing what is true. Well, it's... And how do you get to it? And the, right, the principle as to how we would know what's true and false. I'm Correct. To get to it, but Correct. You're being very competitive. I just want to... It's called a debate stream. What is the, what is yeah, the first word in the stream? debate without getting heated. If you, well, you... you, you really upset, I'm not upset. I'm not upset. I just put... I don't put up with stupid answers. You keep interrupting me. Uh, yeah, because you tried to trap me with your first question about Elisha, okay. right? <laughs> Oh, I'm trying to trap you. Oh, you think it's funny. See, well, here you're you giggling. Why are you you afraid can't afraid answer a basic to... question. You're over here giggling. Now you're trying to act like you're all Everybody pious. Everybody knows that I answer the questions. They can hear. You didn't answer anything. You just stated that we rely on certain scholars. That's begging the question. Saying certain scholars is not an epistemic principle. It's connected with using logic and reason Oh. and information. How do you know you're using the right logic and reasoning? I'll answer if you let me finish. You're, you just keep saying, go. Okay. Okay, so there are, I mean, well, let's yeah, talk so about you, the exactly. So no where answer. The, where the scripture, where the, 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 the That's very childish of you. But we're all the. Yeah, because I don't put up with your arrogant, I'm condescending, you Gnostic bullcrap, dude. I'm asking you a question. Were the Gospels all written that. My question time? was what's your epistemic okay. principle? Has not been answered. You're asking me a question. Okay, so. <sighs> Yeah, you're not a very good debater. You're right, not I'm not a good debater. Right, so you who has never debated anybody, I've debated the top people in the world. I'm not a good debater. You don't even know what you're debating. You're lost. You're flustered. <laughs> I'm trying to help you out, but you think okay. I'm just being mean. You're so arrogant that you can't understand what's at what's at root here. What's that question? Do you understand that? Do you see that? When what's your answer? epistemic principle? When can I talk? What's your epistemic principle? Don't interrupt me, and I'll tell you. What's your epistemic principle? Are you going to let me answer? If you don't answer, I'm going to boot you because I'm asking you this about 20 times. What's okay. the epistemic and principle? You keep interrupting me. What's the epistemic principle? See, if you keep bitching, I'm going to boot you. Let me finish. See, you're, you're not letting me finish. All you, you're, this is a time waster. This is filibustering. What's the epistemic principle? You're, 
you. What is it? It's like you said, logic and reasoning. Okay, just saying logic and reasoning is not I'm a justification. Exactly. This is what you get with the idiocy. Of, this is what Gnosticism gives you. Idiocy. Next up. Amelie. This sounds like a treasure. Hi. Hello. Can you mm. hear me there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, happy Christmas to everyone. Although this is a um, partisan um, uh, festivity that I'm not agree with, but... Anyway, it's just uh, for say hello to everyone. I want to take a point, which is, I think, the most important. Um, look, it's very simple. It's the golden rule that Jesus Christ show us with his actions. By the fruit, you will know them. So Jesus Christ was there all around telling the truth going in and out of, of, of prison because he was um, a leader of uh, anarchists that will not believe in any power. You are totally him. off. No uh, idea what you're talking about. You're completely uh, off. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. Wait, wait a minute. No, I'm not going to listen to oh, you. No, what no. are you talking about? Jesus is an anarchist? What are you talking about? Jesus Christ. You've never read the Gospels. No. What are you talking? And he's not an anarchist. I I read everything. You've I read, read everything. everything. Yeah. Yes, I was kidnapped and I was oh, uh, yeah. raped with nine okay. years old. Yeah, I'm sure. And I searched mm -hmm. for God with nine years old. I know what trauma is. Moving on. <clears throat> it's almost like we. <laughs> That's why I've agreed to just accept the mental illness of all of this because we know we're not going to get an actual debate. So we might as well just have the mentally ill people just saying just gibberish, the Gnostics just flustering and giggling and yelling. Let's see. And I'm trying to choose the craziest look. It's working so far. Like I'm trying to choose, like looking at the profile, like, all right, that's going to be a Gnostic goober. Uh, let's see. Let's pick another. What's the most goofy looking something over here? Here's another uh, pictureless profile. <clears throat> These are always the best. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, hello, Jay. I'm I'm a really big fan of you. I just uh, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, excuse me if I sound a little bit off, but I'm a little bit uh, tipsy because I just got back from a a family um, mm -hmm. uh, like dinner um, because mm -hmm. it's uh, Christmas Eve, and mm -hmm. Eve and all. So I just want to. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to uh, say that I'm a Roman Catholic. Um, and I just want to tell you that uh, I agree with a lot of what you say when it comes to Roman Catholicism. I feel like when it comes to our faith in particular, I think um, I think Vatican II. It's <sighs> my whole thing with Vatican II is that I think it was just a complete and utter like. It wasn't even part of the church. Like I think it was just a um, experiment uh, done by the <clears throat> elites, mm -hmm. and like yeah, uh, it's not even it's not a part of the church, even though it was uh, confirmed by the Pope for the entire church with full apostolic authority on faith and morals. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But it's not and part of the church. The, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, exactly. Everything. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good job. That's why trad cats have to drink to cope. So. <clears throat> Moving on, I want to remind you guys that we have a mini sponsor here. Why is this not working? You got me. To, I'm sassy today, y'all. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sassy. I don't know what you want from me. I said I was going to be 
humble Protestant pastor telling you everything you wanted to hear. But I've turned into a mean man again. I tried within, how long have we been going? Within one hour, I got mean. Within one hour of Gnostic nonsense, gibbering, flustered incoherence. And then we had a drunk, foreign, whatever she was, woman yelling at me that Jesus is an anarchist. I'm immediately a mean man. So I guess it's just time to give up the year of love, 2024. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm going to keep striving, guys, to listen. People people who are always fussing about what I do, like they don't know what it's like to have a, an actual debate. And the reason that people think I'm interrupting people, they think that I'm being mean or that I just don't want to answer their questions or I don't, I'm scared to let them have a chance to answer. And it's none of that at all. It's because when I ask a person a question in an, in an exchange, now you notice in that exchange, I let him ask me about five questions about my views, right? And I answered all of his views or all of his questions. <clears throat> then I asked him like one or two questions, right? And when he started to answer he was immediately going to a an assertion, a claim that doesn't answer and avoids the question I'm asking. So if I'm asking for an epistemic principle, and he says, based on the scholars that are reliable that I know, that's not an epistemic principle. Or if he thinks it is, it's very easy to refute. Do you understand? And when I ask him, what do you think an epistemic principle is? And he says, well, it's like logic and reason, like you say. Yeah, but now you're going to have to give an account for logic and reasoning. It doesn't, you can't just say, oh, I, I appeal to logic and reason. Like there's some dudes over there that help me out. Like I'm in the middle of the debate and I'm over here like, Psst, hey, hey, logic, come over here, dude. Bring your friend reason. Tell me what the answer is. Oh, uh, my appeal is to my buddies, logic and reason. The rap duo, logic and reason, right? You can't just say logic. It has to have, give, you have to give an account. Good grief. By the way, there's actually a really good exegesis of the Bears passage in James Jordan's book where he covers the fact that the word that's used there is not infants. Right? It's not like it's not like 40 infants were just rolling around the streets of Jerusalem and Elijah was over there like just calling out bears to maul the infants. The word is like young youth gang, like teens, troubled, evil teens. And to mock a person who's a known representative and voice of God is to mock God himself. So we're basically, we're talking about the sharks and the jets here, dissing God's prophet. And the bear comes out and destroys the evil teens. It's not a bunch of babies, goo goo gaga, w crawling through the streets of Jerusalem, and then the prophet just out of nowhere, uh, bear, get them. <laughs> this is so stupid. They're a bunch of young punks, dude. But he, <clears throat> that wasn't even going to go. It wasn't even going to go there. I mean, that was like, we are speaking different languages, I think, like because when we when I talk about what it like when we ask people for a justification for their beliefs or their principles, like they have they still have no idea what we're talking about. By the way, if you want to support us, <clears throat> we have a new mini sponsor here with Lore Coffee. This is an org organic coffee company, and you can uh, purchase Lore right there. <clears throat> Go check out their stuff. Use the promo code. Actually, I think you just use that affiliate link right there, and you support also. Uh, FDA as well, if you would like to get some coffee. <coughs> <coughs> Good grief. So again, people don't, people don't even know what debate is. They have no idea how it works, how it functions. And they literally think when I am calling people back from trying to use red herrings, that it's all just tricks and tactics and I'm being mean. 
Man, it's just super stupid. Like, you really? So let's say that we're playing chess. And let's say that you guys are watching me play chess with somebody online. It's a live stream of a chess match. And I'm over here doing chess things. And then the other person comes and says, Oh, <clears throat> um, here's my checker piece. And I'm going to knock over your king with my checker piece. I win. What would you all think about that? You would think it's ridiculous. It's, it's an invalid move. Checker pieces don't work in this game. That's a violation of the rules of this game. Likewise, debate functions on rules. You don't just make them up. They're not arbitrary. You can't pick and choose. Well, uh, we all pick and choose. Uh, uh. I mean, like he's confused. <laughs> Picking and choosing is not the same thing as picking verses to talk about. I mean, it was just like unbelievable, but <clears throat> yeah. So again, why, why will you not debate people who l literally have absolutely no, no, it's like you have no knowledge of what you're talking about. People in the chat it was ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. That's what I'm trying to convey to you. And you just want to sit there and giggle like you think it, like you think you're winning or getting something over on me or something. It, it's it's not harming me, dude. It's harming you. I want you guys to to call in that are fussing in the chat. Just call in. It's an open forum. This is golden opportunities here. Let's see. Jean Sant, JJ Page. Uh oh. Anybody that's got an old 1800s looking dude in their profile, we know that's going to be trouble. Got to unmute, man. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I'm you. <laughs> it's, what's up? What's on your mind? Interesting. So, uh, Jay, I'm, I'm not really familiar with you. I'm, I just kind of stumbled upon this space. Uh, I was interested. What, what is your, uh, uh, what is your view on God or what is your, uh, religion, so to speak? Orthodox Christian. Uh, I believe God is a Trinity. Uh, and I affirm the traditional Orthodox Catholic view. What about you? Uh, I am inquiring into Catholicism uh, right now. I'm not uh, technically Catholic, but I attend Mass regularly. Mm. Uh, what what uh, what would make you choose Roman Catholicism? Well, I'm just kind of inquiring into it right now. I I do believe that. Uh, the Pope and the uh, structure of the church is like uh, descendant from the early church fathers. What would, uh, what would you say in response to someone who believes that, like, why would someone choose Eastern Orthodoxy or Orthodoxy rather than Catholicism? I would say that the uh, post second millennium papal superstructure that we see in documents like Dictatus Pape in 1074 are absolutely nothing like the way the church functioned in the first thousand years. And so it is categorically false that the papacy exemplifies the Christianity of the first thousand years. I would say that there are numerous contradictions and changes in dogma that also prove the, the papacy to be a fallacious, ridiculous position. And, sec and lastly, uh, the last uh, several years of Francis has uh, only borne this out a thousandfold. Interesting. Thank you for that. I, I'm not really a theologian. I don't have anything to argue for, so you can send me back down to listeners, but uh, Merry Christmas. <clears throat> you too, and I'm not trying to be mean to you. Uh, have you heard of Dictatus Pape as an example? No, I have not. So, just real quick, and I've got it pulled up on the screen here. This is the <clears throat> Pope Gregory the Seventh. He's the famous Pope 
the time of the Gregorian reforms. And uh, he listed out these, what he called the dictates, that were entered into his register in 1075. Um, and it continued to be there for many decades later. Uh, and actually the Pope after Gregory, I forget which one he was, but it's in the Meyendorf book that I've been talking about um, in great detail. There's a whole there's a whole chapter in this book on how even Gregory the Seventh didn't actually accomplish a lot of these um, dictates being accepted. It was his successor that did. But regardless, <clears throat> the dictates are things like the Roman Church was founded by God alone. Well, you can go read Irenaeus where he talks about the Roman Church being the Church of Peter and Paul. The Roman Church alone is universal. Um, well, ever since the Ecumenical Councils, the Patriarch of Constantinople was also called universal. Um, the Pope alone chooses the bishops in the world. Well, that's not how the Pope uh, operated in the first thousand years because any metropolitan or three bishops could choose to uh, ordain a bishop. So the Pope didn't decide all the bishops in the world. The Pope alone can use the imperial insignia. You think in the first thousand years of the church, the Pope alone could use the imperial insignia? Right. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not yeah. familiar with that. Right. Well, I'm not trying to be mean to you, but uh, I would take a look at Dictatus Pape because uh, it's a great example of what you're signing on to. And <clears throat> although the papacy, uh, you know, post Vatican II or whatever, has definitely shied away from a lot of these outlandish Quisat Tatarat God Emperor claims, it's still there. I mean, it's still something that they mandated. In fact, they said if you don't accept the temporal supremacy of the Pope, a la Unum Sanctum, you are damned. And now you don't even have to believe that. So, yeah, this is a religion where the innovations stem from the papacy itself. Austin. What's up, Austin? I'm you. Are you there? Moving on. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Thank you guys for those super chats. Much appreciated. We will get to the super chats here in a second. Brandon. I'm mute. Yo. Yes, sir. Did I hear my name? Yep. Cool. I was over here practicing on this uh, broken guitar. That's awesome. How you dude. doing, man? Good. What's up? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering, do you do you have like a a special Christmas dinner you guys make over there? Yes, we make. Long duck dong. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Modern native. What's up, dude? You gotta unmute. When are you going to debate the Jews? Uh, I've had one Jewish guy offer to debate in four years, and he went to debate Freemasonry. So. Brandon? No, not Brandon. Dude, you gotta unmute, man. Guys, you it mutes hey. you. Yes, sir. Howdy. Hey. So you were talking earlier about a epistemological principle, like how do we even have a meaningful conversation? I think that's key, right? Like if you're gonna have a conversation, you have to agree to terms. Sure. Um, if you want to talk about formal argument, I think. A good place to start off with is scratching off the list of things that are not true and then narrowing it down to things that are. Um, specifically using the law of non-contradiction and modus tollens, I think you can kind of tear apart most of postmodern thinking and throw it to the wayside Okay. before you can have a more objectivist approach. Uh, specifically, you know, the whole idea that everything's a construct except for apparently the construct that everything's a construct that's obviously yeah. 
a truth claim and self-negating. Right. Um, so basic precept critique. Right. Or everything's a matter of perspective, except for the perspective that everything's a matter of perspective. Um, it's absolutely true. There are no absolutes. We know that you can't know anything. Mm-hmm. Like all these things. Yeah. Totally smuggle agree. Smuggle in truth claims while pretending not to. Right. Or maybe the most morally bankrupt of all of them that there are no greater meta narratives or truth claims. There's only power, which is a low key admission of moral bankruptcy because. Yeah. If you believe the only thing that is true is power, you're going to lie, steal, and cheat to get what you want in the name of the quote-unquote greater good. So that's obviously, uh, you know, someone like that can't be trusted and shouldn't be debated. Um, So I think just by narrowing it down to that, um, I think there is actually a logical principle for talking about an objectivist position. Um, Yeah, that's the direction I was going in if we had continued in a rational discourse. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious what you think about this specific argument. You know, in all of language, a lot of terms are subjective, to be fair, to the postmodernists to play the devil's advocate, but they're not all completely subjective. Like, uh, the word absolute is pretty uh, binary. You know, something can't be sort of absolute or kind of absolute. It either is or it isn't. So the degree of the claim is stay within the claim itself, which is, you know, absolute. So we know that it violates the law of non-contradiction to say that it's absolutely true. There are no such things as absolutes. So therefore, there's only one, by virtue of modus tollens, one uh, argument that remains, which is absolutely true. But a lot of people push on back, push back on this and say, like, well, who cares? Because in order to say what the absolute truth is, you'd have to be standing from an absolute yeah, vantage point I, I of know. knowledge and right so you know yeah, i'm not yeah. trying to be rude but this is the presuppositional transcendental argumentation internal critique that we do all the time sure so my question is if you have to be standing from an absolute vantage point to say what the truth is um and since no mere mortal has the luxury of saying that what it is because no one has absolute knowledge or data except for maybe god yeah god like, god serves that function it? god serves that function in the world yeah Sorry, say it again. God serves that function in the worldview and in the argument. Sure. But arguing it from like a a position of non faith to someone who is you're debating, um, isn't the point to win over the debater not necessarily to win the argument? No, the point is sorry, well, I mean I've been debating for twenty years and in my experience the point of debates is for the audience, it's not to you rarely will you convince the opponent. Well, how about this? If you can say that absolute truth exists, but it's forever beyond our reach because no one has the absolute vantage point. Well, that would be a contradiction. Can you then infer that, like, um, there must be truth that is transcendental, that is outside of our vantage point, outside of our perception and independent of our perception and even existence? Well, I mean, I just think the statement itself would be meaningless and unjustified because how are you, you can't, how are you going to claim that there's truth that's outside of our you know reach it just doesn't, the phrase itself doesn't make any sense you don't then you well, can't know ontologically, that ontologically just like you can't prove beauty or human rights or anything well, you know, think, but you can assert I think it. you can prove those things so what do you mean how would you prove them through the transcendental argument what do you mean yeah so I guess what do you mean yeah and other than a other than an appeal to like some sort of absolute vantage point, AKA God, then you have to narrow it down to like, you know, I don't um, need to narrow it down because the argument is the transcendental argument for God's existence. So it includes those things. uh, You're you're talking about specifically a religious vantage point. Are you talking about revelational theism is the argument I would make. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you start off with like, I can, if you do a lot of public debates, I can see why you would not be interested in winning over uh, the debater. And to be fair, a lot of times people come in deeply digged into their position. So I get, you know, why that would not be primarily your goal. Um, but I used to be uh, an anti-theist, an atheist, and I was won over uh, by a Christian minister. Um, yeah, sometimes that can happen, you yeah. Yeah, and there are those of us out there. So I think 
you know, it's it's worth trying to make the effort, even if it seems silly, because I used to be one of the most uh, opposed people you could possibly meet, you know. Um, but I, over the course of seven years, changed my mind. So... Yeah, and I think that's you're right, right. To, to say, too, there that it's not – typically it's not one debate that's going to change people's minds. Usually it's a series of events over a span of time, like you said, many years. I mean, it's not going to be one thing. But if you're hopping into the middle of this, if you're not familiar with what we do – I mean, we've been doing this for years. We've opened it up. I mean, we – what I usually do, and I've said this for many years on here, is that when I when people come on – um, they're going to, it's kind of like debate school here. They're going to be held to certain standards and the purpose here, and we're going to have fun along the way and joke around, but the purpose here is to call people back to invalid moves, right? So when people think I'm interrupting and being mean, I'm calling them back to an invalid move. Just like if we were playing chess and somebody took the queen and, uh, or, or the pawn and moved it all the way over there to take down my king out of nowhere at the first move. That wouldn't worry be an invalid move. I said, no, no, go back, start over. So that's what this is. This is like debate school in a way. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so, and it's, it's informal. This is not a formal debate. Um, but a lot of people are always asking me, they're like, Help me to debate better. Help me to, I want to learn to do better in rhetoric and in this kind of stuff. So that's partly what we're doing here as well. It's kind of helping people understand and hear bad argumentation and hear it called out. So there's a lot of different purposes as to what we're doing here today. And it's not primarily to uh, necessarily convince the immediate opponent because I get a lot of trolls and there's a lot of bad faith people that hop on here and they're not interested in being convinced or learning the truth. They just want to be silly and they will get silliness back. So again, it just depends on the context of who hops on here. Gotcha. I do think that one thing that's like sorely missing is this whole idea of quantity and quality of evidence, generally speaking in our public discourse. Like if there's a lot of quality evidence, probably true not a lot of quality evidence evidence probably not true and if it's a mixed bag of like mixed quality or mixed quantity you know you have to parse it out but it seems like there's a lot of stuff that just gets thrown out there and there's very little evidence for it whatsoever and it just goes by un completely unquestioned that i mean if you're talking about general uh, discourse in modern society yeah most people are not able to operate in a coherent logical discourse way <laughs> But I don't know what you're talking about, throwing, yeah. throwing out stuff without significant... I don't, are you talking about the context of religion? What are you talking about? Just in the context of really anything. Like, if, if you go to court, you know, you can have some solid evidence, but if there's just a little bit of it, it's only going to have so much sway. I guess it depends on the evidence. But if you have a lot of evidence and it's solid, you know, you've got a strong case. And I just... Sometimes I hear people say just throw out meager evidence and it's really incoherent and discombobulated. I'm just like, why would you think that would fly? You know, like, yeah. um, you know, like I don't understand why we sort of discount one for the other. It seems like both quality and quantity should always be considered in conjunction. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case a lot of times. Right. Well, I'm not an evidentialist, so I don't think that evidence is ultimately uh, do the work that most evidentialists think that they can do but we do have to use evidences for sure but uh i agree with your overall points yeah because it was the fine tuning argument that really caught my eye back when i was an atheist and also trying to come up with like a logical um a, a sort of uh a secular ethic a universal secular secular ethic i tried to undertake that and i very quickly realized how impossible that was because you can't be divorced from your time and place, your socioeconomic status, your parents, your DNA, right. the schools you went up to, the language. And then even the choices you make are made through a sort of a cultural grid, which is a set of incentives and punishments. And people always tend to gravitate towards the incentives and shy away from the punishments. And so we're really just sort of a snapshot of our time and place. And, you know, how could you how could you privilege your Western individualism over someone's Eastern collectivism? Yeah, yeah, a great point. Ago? Exactly. <clears throat> yeah, totally. So there has to be like an, an absolute vantage point to like Martin Luther King Jr. said in letters from Birmingham prison or the Nuremberg trials or William Wilberforce. They, you know, there has to be God's law to call out man's law when man's law becomes unjust. Mm. So, 
And I was like, well, it's just, it's impossible or it's nihilism. I mean, it's either God or it's nihilism. Mm -hmm. Because everything else is just (coughs) sort of imperialistic ethnocentrism. Mm -hmm. Um, So. All right. Yeah. Well, I agree with those points. Yeah. Good points. Thanks, man. Modern native uh, got some good uh, philosophical insights there. Let's see who's next. Uh, Jose or no, wait. Let's see. I'm trying to feel, I'm trying to see who from their profile picture looks meaner. Tyler looks pretty mean. Looks like he's ready to beat some butts. You better whip some butts. What's up, Tyler? I'm here, Jay. Yes, sir. I um, I um, I caught, I um, found out about you through you know Alex Jones, and um, I I uh, became a Christian uh about three years ago. Um, I was uh, technically non-believer. Um. My uh, uh, the mother of my children, uh, she ended up uh, getting into, getting into witchcraft and um, uh, prostitution ring, like a Freemason prostitution ring, and I I was uh, came face to face with with real evil, and um, from that day forward, I've realized like hey, if, if there's evil, that's real, then I know mm. that um, God's real. Um, but uh, that, and that's a little bit of, that's my background. Um, but I just had some questions for you. Um, I ended up um getting baptized in a seventh day adventist church and um i have a very open mind i don't um you know i'm, I'm open to any and that's why i wanted to talk to you to get some of it. so um I just a few questions for you it, this is all what i've uh you know determined in my in my thinking in my opinion but would you say is is satan bringing about a self-fulfilling prophecy through revelation because it, it seems like uh, for everything they'd be going down that that exact way that God, he was going to do that no matter what God uh, had written in the Bible. Would you, is that correct? I think, you know, as Paul says that the mysteries of the church and the incarnation were hidden from the powers and principalities of this world. So I think that we don't exactly know what Satan can and can't understand or how deep he understands or sees things. I think that regardless when he made his choice in the aeon at the beginning, when the angels fell, he confirmed himself in this perpetual movement towards evil. So what exact degree of knowledge he has of the overall plan of God scripture seems to speak as if there's things hidden from him. He's not omniscient. So I don't know if I would say he's intentionally uh, fulfilling a self-fulfilling prophecy or he's just sort of like a madman, berserker guy hell-bent on, you know, just destruction and chaos because that's what he chose to do. Right, and, and that's kind of what I thought initially, but the more I think about it, it's would you, is it possible that um, he's trying to call God's bluff in some way, like, or Jesus' bluff, I guess you'd say, that he's going to convince the people that there will not be a second coming and he's going to bring about all the prophecies of revelation. And when they, when they, they come about and, and Jesus doesn't appear, then that would make everyone, you know, a non-believer, even though he, he would know that, you know, eventually something's going to happen, but our judgment would come down. But, um, you know, he's, he's trying to, um, uh, you know, get as many people to hell as he can so that's just something i, I thought i'd bounce off your chest um uh, i'm not sure i mean as to what degree like his plans are to try to trick people about the incarnation i don't know i mean it's it's hard to say exactly what i mean we have basic ideas in the orthodox church about the things that are going to happen as we move towards the end whenever that is but i don't know if we know exactly all the details of the satanic plan and we do know things like there will be a great apostasy of the church. There will be, you know, <clears throat> an attempt to rebuild uh, Solomon's temple, an attempt to <clears throat> have a one world religion, all this kind of stuff, one world government, the worship of a single uh, political leader as God, Antichrist. I mean, we, we know those kinds of things are coming, but as to the specifics of like, it'll be AI and Satan will has this plan to like make everybody believe that it's the second coming. I mean, maybe, I just don't know. So it's, it's, it's very speculative. Um, <clears throat> uh, Father Deacon, are you there? Yeah. Did you want to chime in at all? Uh, do you have a, a couple things to say or do you want me to, do you want to just keep going? No, I'm just here. And, um, I enjoyed that last gentleman. Um, 
with the epistemological questions and um you know i'm i'm throwing out uh for people to give me their best objections a tag um, yeah so father deacon if you go over to his twitter page is asking for uh people who have serious objections to the transcendental argument i think he's wanting to kind of collect those and then respond to them in something he's doing yeah so i, I mean i don't mind arguing here but the the thing on my um twitter acts um i'm not challenging people i've just i really just want to know what people think and how they've kind of experienced tags hang-ups um some of the best objections and you don't even have to agree with the objections just objections that you think hey i think this is worthy of responding to um because i'm collecting that and um writing a paper so um any feedback that anybody has is, is wonderful <coughs> and even on here too I'd, I'd love just to hear what people think thank you for that um <coughs> i am going to uh briefly do this while i go to the little girl's room Chad mode is your ultimate natural pre-workout designed to take your performance to this level. Chad mode is for natty beast alphas only. Whether you're hitting the gym, invading a favela, conquering a small village, gambling, burning the midnight oil, mogging on your coworkers, or getting banned from Facebook, Chad mode gives you the competitive edge you need. It's as simple as mixing one or two scoops of our fine powder into water or juice providing you with a delicious, energizing beverage featuring a burst of sweet, organic fruit flavor. Chad Mode will give you the extra edge you desperately crave. Chad Mode stands out from the crowd by excluding artificial flavors, preservatives, sweeteners, and dyes. We've even avoided so-called natural flavors, ensuring a clean and effective formula. Only soy boys and betas guzzle blue dye and sucralose, further tanking their already low testosterone levels. Chad Mode is made in America. Unlike your common TikTok peasant's pre-workout powder, it does not contain Chinese lab-made caffeine and artificial sweeteners that soy boys so often crave. Experience the pure goodness of Chad Mode with Blue Magic registered trademark organic blue spirulina extract, organic lemon, cherry, and organic maple crystals. Forget synthetic caffeine. Embrace the natural power of organic green coffee bean extract. Each dose of Chad Mode mirrors the caffeine kick of a cup and a half of coffee, delivering a surge of energy alongside essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and herbal extracts. Chad Mode will allow you to fire your boss and mog on anyone who opposes you. Chad Mode will give you a dominant and aggressive edge, like a lion hunting a gazelle where the gazelle is a TikTok gym zoomer macro guzzling sucralose on the daily, edging to TNF videos. Whether you're seeking a high-potency, junk-free pre-workout or a better way to kickstart your day, Chad Mode has you covered. It's not just for men. Chad Mode is a solution for anyone ready to conquer their fitness and life goals, dominate their coworkers, and aggressively I show off something that we're all proud of. I got a browser here. This is uh, Jay Dyer's much vaunted, much sought after Philosophy 101. Now, he just got this page up. We are just testing it out. You give them the first people to see. I want to say, for my part, it's not philosophy 101. I think this is a mis mistitling. I really think is as, as like philosophy unleashed. Because a philosophy 101 course, they give you kind of some useless information that you can't make sense of. Jay actually lays out over 12 weeks, dozens and dozens of hours put into just the presentation of this, let alone the hundreds and thousands of hours of research that it takes to have a coherent evolution and history of the origins of philosophy, the uses of philosophy, the different ways to look at it over time, and how that has uh, been brought about to what we have today, which is almost an absence of philosophy on the objective logic and reason side and an overabundance of woke philosophy that is irrational and is made up day by day as people are like, I think we should bring racism back and then here's a justification and then it gets wokeified and, and spread out. And then all of a sudden you have a bunch of communist socialist ideas where you become the property in action. You need to be able to stand your own ground. It helps to have a foundation in philosophy because it's a method to find truth. When you get down to it, philosophy is there because you. And it is uh, as far as the notes and the, the type of coffee, it's a balanced and sweet. 
So that means you don't have to put your um, industrial waste cream or uh, your satanic sugar in it to enjoy. So if you're on a keto carnivore, um, hey, great. Get it. Consider um, supporting Patristic Faith and Jay Dyer um, and Laura Coffee by purchasing that. And also, I want to remind you guys, too, thank you, Father Deacon. Uh, I've got the link, as I said, to the Laura Coffee there. That's his affiliate. You can also support me via uh, heading over to chalk.com. You just saw the ad. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off not just the Chad Mode pre-workout, but all the excellent products over there, including the Tonk Adelie including the Action 2.0, including the uh, the Daily. All of those are excellent products over at Chalk to enhance your performance at the gym and in any other masculine activity. It's also for the ladies. It's not just for dudes. So head on over to Chalk.com. Remember, you can also, as you see in the background here, get this book right here. I got multiple stacks of copies of Meta Narratives in. You can get those over at the website in the shop. You can also get the Red Book. Essays on Theology and Philosophy, as well as all the other old classic books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2, in the shop. And Jay's analysis, choices for $5. Can you make a video tour of the library? We already, we already did that. <clears throat> Donut this $5. Do a JF impression where he says, Imagine that the computer simulates your brain being R-A-P-E-D by a monkey, and then... There you go. <laughs> Mind hack since ten dollars and says Merry Christmas. Thank you, Mind Hack. Much appreciated. Haven't seen you around in the super chat domain for a while. Glad to see you back. Ten dollars. Ten sends eleven dollars. What if Alien Yoda was twerking? Ooh, I don't know. Would that be would that make you a perv? I mean, or would it be cute? You tell me. Kolokolov bang five dollars. Did the harrowing of Hades happen outside of time? Um, I don't think we know the way that the spiritual realm or the realm of the dead and the noetic realm, the way it, it seems to interact with time but not be bound by time. So in some way things happen instantaneously or, or the correlation between the movements are, are different between time and space. So we don't know. But it seems to have happened in some way relating to time because... It happened between the time of Christ dying, descending, and resurrecting. So in some way, there was a temporal connection there. Can you point me to fathers on this subject? Uh, Hilarion Alfiev has a whole book on the, uh, the harrowing of Hades. So that would probably be the most expansive book on the subject. Ganner, $16, and two cents. Jay, Merry Christmas, two questions. Do a review of Altered Carbon. Uh, maybe. Uh, I just haven't really committed to a lot of these more recent kind of seems like everything post 2016 and sci-fi is just all woke. And so it's just it's unwatchable do uh, or analysis because it's a super revealing dystopia <clears throat> unblock me on Twitter. Um, I don't know. I usually find that the people that I blocked were blocked for good reason. I have no idea why I blocked you. Um, if you unblock me, I will finally take care of the way that you cough. So does that mean you have the antidote to the T virus that you gave me? Alexander Soldier needs in $10. <clears throat> uh, I want to say thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alexander. James Fedgy for $3. Can you elaborate what Arianism is? Arianism is the doctrine that Christ is the first, that Jesus, the Son of God, is the first thing that the Father created before the foundation of the world, and then he moved on to create everything else. So Jesus becomes a kind of demigod, uh, and then Je and then <clears throat> salvation consists in a kind of a moral realignment where you become like Jesus in the sense of being more and more of a moral person. So <clears throat> then explain to me why penal substitutionary atonement is Arian, uh, because the idea that the son is damned in our place would require either an Nestorian Jesus or an Arian Jesus, because you can't damn the second person of the Trinity. He's God from all eternity. You can't split the Trinity. So very simple. That's the simple presentation. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Glitchy $3. <clears throat> Some people owe, think that you owe them time because you do this show. Thank you for your work. By the way, have you heard the Yuri Vesmanov clip? Just kidding. Yeah, exactly. Glitchy $5. <clears throat> In other words, entitled people think that you owe them because you're doing this. Merry Christmas. <coughs> Merry Christmas to you and your queen. So shout outs to, 
uh, Tim and Eric Krimbus there. <coughs> Thank you, Eric. <coughs> Arena, $25. Thank you so much, Arena. Um, well, we did get a, <coughs> we did get a wine mom yelling at us tonight, didn't we? That was a sweet surprise. That was a sweet wine. So sweet cherry wine, sweet red, right? Like, uh, Steve Brule says, <coughs> sweet cherry red. <coughs> and she set us straight, yelled at us, told us that Jesus was a anarchist. And her justification was because she had been through trauma. Well, I'm sorry for your trauma, but that doesn't have anything to do with whether your views are correct or not. So, <coughs> um, got a few more minutes. I'll try to <coughs> make this last bit quick here. Dr Mr. Victor one of one. I can't doctor one of one or something. Got to unmute. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. What's up? Merry Christmas to you. I'm more excited for the New Year part, but, you know, there's a lot of money going in and out right now. Going in and out of what are you talking about? The, well, Christmas, you know, um, is like the last Q4 holiday that you know a lot of people are spending their money okay did you have anything related to the topic or what's up the topic is all right God. we're moving on <clears throat> crusader how you got you got crusader in your name and you got an orthodox cross how does that work can you hear me yep barely Yeah, I mean, we've addressed that many times in live streams, probably 10 different live streams five or six years ago. So, I mean, monarchy is the ideal political system. Um, that's nowhere near anywhere on the table of what we can really expect. So that really only makes sense when the majority of the people in the society have the right Orthodox faith. Otherwise, it's really, it really doesn't, doesn't even matter. But I do have many old streams on um, what the best form of governance is emu uriarte this sounds wild i'm gonna beta emu hello yes sir um i'm sorry can you hear me well i can okay thank you very much i just want to say i'm a big fan of you jay dyer mm. and i actually i actually did want to focus on that thing you just got done saying which thing because uh, the the monarchy versus like democracy and those types of uh, world systems. Uh -huh. I guess I can see how the monarchy system would function like better in a way when you have like a complete like a faithful society. But do you think that leads to like the actual better flourishment of the the people that participate within it, or do you think that's just more sort of a like it's a setup to maintain the moral framework of the society rather than the actual like prosperity of it maybe i'm not saying that right i mean it sounds like a utilitarian argument like well we're going to choose a system based on what gives us the best what monetary or um social gains like i mean we should just have the bitcoin bitcoin society because that's going to give us the most gains so what i don't understand your question like you're saying I'm sorry. Or, is, or is, is monarchy true because uh is it the best because it it's not, it's not the best because it's not going to give us the most gains. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, I would think it would be ideal, but I just don't think it... I think historically, monarchist societies have, like, naturally kind of eroded to more of, like, a parliamentarians, especially in the West, where... Why do you like think that erosion people. happened, though? I mean, it, it, that's not the... That's not the... 
most societies in history haven't been <laughs> parliamentarian or republics or democracies. They've been monarchies. I mean, I understand that, but you don't think the most like powerful and effect. I get yeah, powerful and effective doesn't necessarily equate to good, but uh, you know what's helpful? Is- ex- <laughs> that just caught me off guard. I don't know why I even mentioned that. I was about the, to- the, the Hans- reason Hans- I even joined. I'm sorry to derail Hans- it was Hans- about Hans- Catholicism Hans- and and uh, orthodoxy. Hold on, because I, I just want ahead. pause one second. Let let Father Deacon reply. Go ahead. I was gonna say uh, the Hans Hermann Hop. Uh, okay, uh, so. I was... I can you not hear him? Was... No, I cannot. Okay, sorry. can you pause just one second? He's talking. The Hans Hermann Hoppe article uh, from Aristocracy of Monarchy is really good. And it sh- it, sh- it shows the change uh, and the, the corruption that led to kind of parliamentarism that you mentioned. Right. Uh, but one thing that's really important, you have to understand that it's a fundamental because, as, like Jay said... Because of fundamental ideological and philosophical changes that occurred, um, specifically in modernity, the way that man related and thought about the state changed. The state um, in antiquity was there to the laws, not to prevent them um, and give them these kind of libertarian rights and prevent them from killing each other, but to actually encourage and establish a framework in which the citizen could acquire virtue. So as Jay said, there isn't this kind of notion of like monetary success. The most important thing in the, in the mind of the um, an ancient was acquiring virtue and becoming a better person. And so you'll see even in that article, the Hans Hermann Hoppe thinks, even though he's in, you know, an anarcho, um, an anarchist, he thinks the most natural form of government is monarchy, but these ideologies came in and corrupted that and changed it into kind of parliamentary monarchy and then democracy, and it further kind of devolves. So I just point you there as a helpful article. Um, All right, let's check out. Thank you for that. Let's check out Zed Wagner. I'm trying to hurry through a lot of these. Together. There's like 20 people in here. Zed Wagner. What's up, Zed? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, thank you for doing what you do, Jay. You mm. led me to orthodoxy. That's good um, to hear. Good news. I, I, I have a question. I'm not here to debate. I'm totally on, you know, the orthodox position and the tag position. What I have is a question about um, specifically uh, Catholicism and the Jesuit society. Has it always been corrupt or was there a time in which... It was trying to hold true to what it thought the uh, the Catholic teaching and doctrines were, as as flawed as they are, or has it always been like this uh, Freemasonic organization LARPing as a Christian organization? Uh, that's a good question. That would <coughs> probably require somebody who is more of a specialist in the history of the Jesuits to really give you a solid answer on that, because... As time progresses, as we get up into the 20th century, with more and more books being written about the Jesuits, you get a lot more uh, lore, a lot of uh, gibberish, a lot of conspiracy nonsense that sort of becomes an accretion on the story and the history of the Jesuits. So we all know that uh, Ignatius Loyola was a part of some kind of sort of esoteric group before he became a Jesuit. Um, It is possible that when he was amongst this Illuminist type of group, he maintained some of those ideas as he went in, in, into forming the spiritual exercises and whatnot. And there is an overlap of certain groups and people. I mean, even the writers, uh, Quigley talks about in the Anglo-American establishment that the Royal Society elite, the, the Cliveden set and others utilize the spiritual exercises as a manual for how they would kind of run things in a cell structure for their, their power block. But that doesn't mean that they were doing it because they believed Jesuit philosophy. They just thought the ta- the, the tactics and the techniques of having a confessor and the way that the confessor might uh, potentially manipulate you through the Jesuit practices, a la Ignatius's spiritual exercises, could be a technique that they could use. And I think a lot of the low IQ conspiracy crowd thinks that that means that the New World Order is run by Jesuits. No, no, no. They took the Jesuit spiritual 
practices that handlers use or that spiritual confessors use. And that, that gets transferred over into like the intelligence world of like a handler and then his, his operative. Right. So, yeah. so that's part of it. Um, but is it possible that the, there is actually secretly an esoteric thing that the Jesuits are into? That's definitely possible. Um, but I don't know enough about like the whole, the actual history of the Jesuits to say for sure. Um, but I think it's very obvious now that they're completely co-opted. Their, their corporate logo, uh, the black sun, you know, uh, I've, I've seen some writings where that ties back to the, the Kaaba stone and those kinds of things. Um, once again, thank you. And, uh, you can go on to the next caller. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Uh, yeah, the, <clears throat> I think it would really take somebody who probably goes deep into the actual history of, you know, the founding of it and what Ignatius was really into. And I just don't have the knowledge of that to say for sure. <clears throat> David Reed. What's up, David Reed? Hey, what's up, Jay? Thanks for letting me back on. Yes, sir. Hey, so I, another question I had was there was a point in the discussion with Redeem Zoomer where he kind of pressed the idea that if somebody has the potential to sin or not sin, that would entail the fact that they could abstain from sin indefinitely. Yeah, but... He, we didn't, I didn't want to go into the Mary talk because it's a whole other issue to talk about the sinlessness and the ever virginity of Mary with a Calvinist, even though John Calvin believed in the ever virginity of Mary. The point was that Mary is different because Mary was at every point in her life given grace and aided so that she wouldn't sin. And I just, I just didn't even feel like going down that route. So that's because we believe that people can have the effects of the sin and still not be guilty for the sin. And the Calvinist doesn't believe that, right? So Mary is somebody who, for us, she felt all the effects of Adam's sin, and yet herself still did not sin. And so she's a proof against inherited guilt. So that's the strong point of Mary. But Mary is not identical uh, to us because <clears throat> we, uh, for the most part, right, do not concede to grace. So what he's ignoring, he's thinking of it in a Pelagian way, like, Mary was sinless like Pelagius thought about it. Mary was sinless because of grace, right? And so it was a tremendous amount of grace that helped and kept Mary from being uh, a sinner in terms of actual sin. But the rest of us are not going to be free from actual sin. Right. Okay, so there was a, a provision given for Mary in those situations where she might have sinned absent that grace i think we could say that okay okay interesting and so i mean I she's the most grace she's the most graced of all women and all creatures right right and for the record coming into the church i had a pelagian background and so that's why um that was still something i was kind of thinking about you know trying to work through well, <laughs> remember that <laughs> we're conceiving of grace. We're conceiving of grace as different things between us and a Calvinist. So a Calvinist conceive of grace as God's dispositional attitude towards you changing. So you're in grace when God's no longer mad at you and hating you. Right. Right. That's after regeneration. So, <clears throat> but we don't think of grace as merely this dispositional stance. Grace is an actual living power within you that is an uncreated energy. So Mary always had that uncreated energy and power within her at work. And she was supremely graced uh, above all of the other human beings. So <clears throat> it's, and so the Calvinist is missing the synergizing as well there? Yes. And they, they Correct. because they conceive of it in, entirely different. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Because it's a simple act of God's will Correct. to change his disposition yes. towards you. Correct. Okay. All right. 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 Okay. That, that's very helpful. Um, and then just one more question, if I may. Sure. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm trying to think of how to put this. So in the PSA model, uh, the penal substitution area atonement, uh -huh. they say, I've heard William Lane Craig's articulation that 
they don't that basically he says that the Christ felt the separation of God. Yeah. Well, again, that's anti-Trinitarian, right? Because Jesus is a divine person. A divine person cannot be separated from God or from the Father. And he said in an economic sense, he particularly used that. It doesn't matter whether he qualifies it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether he qualifies it as that or not, because the he, the he refers to the divine person of the son. There's no human right. person, Jesus of Nazareth, that's the Arian or, or the uh, Nestorian view, who is right. separated from God. He equals right. second person of the Godhead. Sure. So the second person of the Godhead can't be separated from the Trinity. right? To be separated from God means that the Holy Spirit no longer indwells you. It would mean that the Father's will is set against you. So that would mean that the Trinity is now no longer the case. Because Jesus doesn't share the same will as the Father. The Holy Spirit no longer resides within him. There's no, by the way, there's also, by the way, it would also undo perichoresis, the indwelling. The Father would no longer indwell the Son. What? I believe. I what? believe he denies perichoresis. He doesn't believe in the inseparable operations or anything like that. Yeah, but he's also an Apollinarian, so, I mean, right. I don't know why anybody <laughs> listens to William Lane Craig anyway, but. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So, okay. All right. Well, thanks, Jake. Yeah, good questions. Pretty much all I got. Appreciate it. Uh, I think this will be the last one. I'm going to have to head out. So I'm trying to find. Let's see. Who looks like they're ready to, to set me straight? Who looks nasty and mean? Uh, let's try Flame. Flame. Flame looks like he's going to set us straight. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, um, wait, is the stream ending soon? Or how much time do we have? Well, uh, depends on what you want to talk about. What do you What do you want to get into? Okay, so um, I want to talk about um, biblical morality specifically. So um, before I start, I just want to talk about intuitive. Um, I just want to talk about where I base my morality because um, uh, that's the question usually that you would ask. Okay. So it's mine on intuitive morality. So I think people are born with an intuitive morality, and then it is changed or repressed through cultural and uh, propaganda and stuff what, like that. Okay, what, it, what is, like, is the, what's the intuitive, just a biological drive, what is the intuitive morality? Well, I think it's God-given, specifically. Okay, what God? Um, hmm? What God? Well, I'm not, well, I'm not exactly sure, but um, what I do want to say... Well, how do you know it's God-given if you don't know what God it is? Well, because I think you can get people from all sorts of cultures so you can get people from every culture and they would know that murder lying and stealing is wrong they may have different ideas of what it means but well but what if my god that's intuitively giving me my morals is the devil and i think that those things are not wrong well i think you would know but i just want to get to my main argument first so um okay. because my main argument is mainly a critique so um you say that you base your morality on um, on God and the Bible, but well, but you said you based your morality on God too, but then you couldn't tell me what God it was. So I'm not sure you're going to have a good basis well, for a critique. Yeah, well, because I mean, it is mainly my own. I mean, it might not be a good argument for me because it is a subjective morality. But <laughs> okay, I, oh, there we go. So yeah, so it's subjective. Nice. Go ahead. But uh, my main argument is a critique of a critique of biblical morality. So my, um, I would go. Sorry, I don't usually do talks, so I'm a bit nervous. Um, I just want to... Uh, okay, so with biblical morality, when we go back, there's... Um, it just seems... It seems like kind of... Oh, my head. Uh, okay, it seems very um, arbitrary to me. So, for example, when, um, when it says that the son won't pay for the sins of the father... But then, for example, in the Bible, um, God kills all the firstborn sons of Egypt, or when he kills David's son for a, um, for a sin that David did, or when he tells Abraham to um, sacrifice his son. Even though he stops him, I still see it as like the act itself is basically still done in that way. So from the way I see it, um, um, the way I see it is that how can I... How can I really worship someone like that when it's just, it seems like the morality changes us to 
depending on what God says. So murder is wrong until it isn't. And like... No, murder is always know. wrong. Murder is different from killing. So those are two different things. So murder is always wrong. Killing is not. So when God orders the Israelites to murder, like the children of this or that tribe, mm -hmm. isn't that technically a sin? I mean, I know there's a sense of a collective morality. So if a group does something, they are punished as a group, even though there's members of that group who didn't do anything wrong. So like the infants and the children. And then there's like, um, was it the book of Samuel? I mean, when God was differentiating between the children and mm -hmm. the infants that are still suckling, and he said, kill them both. And he said, kill all the animals. And then he punished, um, not Samuel, he punished, was it Saul? King Saul? Mm -hmm. Was that his name? Yeah. Yeah, he, he punished King Saul because he didn't kill a cow. Um, but he wanted to sacrifice it later, but then he punished him anyway. And I think that was the reason why he replaced him with David, if I'm correct. Yes. And then... I mean, and then there's all the questionable things that God did. Like, for example, with Job, like, um, in the Old Testament, you're constantly promised that if you live a, a righteous life, God will reward you and stuff. But then Job was specifically punished because he lived a righteous life, because he was, um, it was this idea that he was being tested by God. So, I mean, it just seems that whatever you do, you just end up losing in that sense. And with God, it just seems that he's constantly, like, he says murder is wrong, but then he commits murder on innocent. Like when I say murder, I mean killing of innocents. Like, right, I but a the, I, know the dif I know there's a difference between killing and murder. Well, but the like, difference is that right. But the difference is that God has the right to decide when life and death can be ended, or when it can be postponed. Right. So in other words, every system will have to have some ultimate sort of linchpin, or some ultimate authority by which you say that it's wrong or right. Right. So if God decides that in those cases it is right to do that, in our view, it's not out of accord with the rest of God's morals and his ethics because God knows infinitely more than we know. And so like in the book of Job that you mentioned, the thing at the, the, the decision at the end is that, well, God says to Job, how are you going to judge when I make these judgment calls if you can't even figure out the created order? How much more would you be able to figure out and understand the uncreated order? So the point is that every system will have to have some point at which you can't appeal any further, right? And so that's where it becomes right or wrong is not in some arbitrary abstract standard of invariant and personal laws, but in an actual personal being who can make the decisions as to when that is correct and when that is not correct. In other words, God would, for example, know all future contingencies. So had this people group been uh, allowed to live, they might have exterminated the seed of the Messiah. Right? We don't know, right? All of the different um, contingencies that could have occurred had all of the, uh, what we could say, are tainted or infected people that lived uh, at that time that had engaged in extremely brutal and wicked practices. So if when you read Leviticus, the reason the promised land is cleansed is because the people had become extremely uh, degenerate. And so in God's wisdom, there was a need to get rid of all of that people group for the purpose of the furtherance of the the messianic line, the, that lineage, right? So it was ultimately, it wasn't just because God wanted to just worship the DNA of Jews. It was because they were to present and produce the Messiah that would be the one that would save the world. So to say then that, well, but God is wrong for making decisions as to when it's right for him or for because if you look at when this uh discussion comes up in is it uh, it's hannah's prayer she says he's the one that rises up and makes others low he has the 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 right to light and to life and death right so he has the power to kill and to heal right so <clears throat> in other words if we're going to say that it's wrong for god to do that in these cases we need a basis, a moral position from which to say that it's wrong. And I don't think that it's a contradiction to say that in some case, like, for example, Exodus says you can engage in self-defense, right? So in those cases, self-defense isn't murder. Okay, so, I mean, my basis is, like, intuitive morality. I believe everybody is born with that. Like, for example, like, 
you say you need but you already said that's subjective and you don't know where it comes from so how is that that's not going to work as a as an argument against a well yeah i said that before but honestly i believe that we all have the same morality i don't think it's subjective well you know what but even okay hold on but even if that were true that doesn't tell us whether it's right or not okay so for for example i can give a very um a specific one where we can't like so for example when it comes to rape like do you need god to tell you that rape is wrong or don't you just intuitively it doesn't know that that's wrong? not but that's missing the objection so the the objection is not like i said to james sexton could i as a secular person decide to choose the morals of the ten commandments without god yeah but that's not that's a, a, that's avoiding the objection that What's the justification for choosing that? Why would we? Why do we think that that's true? And if you just say, well, because it works, that's arbitrary. So that's not a good reason to say, well, I can have the morals without without the, the deity. I mean, I know I think our intuitive morals comes from God. Now, but you couldn't tell me who that God is or why that's the case, and you can't just saying that there's intuitive morals doesn't tell me what those morals are or whether that's even right what if my more what if my intuitive morals are wrong mm, yeah i mean people could be born with different kinds of intuition but i still think that's slightly better than i mean for example with biblical morality like when moses says that you have to kill um what was it? Was it the Midianites? I think. I'm not sure what tribe, which tribe it was. I think it was the Midianites. Um, when they says like you have to kill all the people and boys and whatever, but you can keep the little girls alive and you can like have your way with them. Like if if this was like a corrupt people and a corrupt blood, in this instance, God didn't like, say you could have your way with the women uh, of the, the. He said that when you conquered a the, tribe, there were laws of marriage. He didn't say you could just have your way with them. Well, it was the virgin little girls of the Midianites, I think. I think. That <laughs> yeah, was they the you, they became they they had what they had their hair shorn and they become brides, right? You can't just have your way with them. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. I mean, yes, things like that, and um, I mean, with this idea that God just knows everything, so in this idea, can so whatever God does, it's always correct in that sense. So yeah, but I, but I mean, that's not, it's possible. not inconsistent because that's who is the ultimate standard in our worldview, right? But like, if he is the ultimate standard, he could pretty much break all his rules and still say this and then tell people. No, to that's called, the, that's, that's a Calvinist view. That's theological voluntarism. So no, he can't just do anything and break all of his rules. Right. So for example, God cannot lie, Paul says. Can God... Can God like manipulate or force people to do things that He wants? Um, no, He doesn't force people to do things. But He does. Like for example, with the Pharaoh in Exodus, He hardened his heart. Yeah. So you, that if way, you he read the do. other verse, it says how He hardened Pharaoh's heart by letting Pharaoh uh, choose, uh, giving giving Pharaoh up to his own desires, is what it says. So you're just you're missing the other passage, which explains how that occurs. Are you a Muslim? You sound like you've got like an Islamic sort of Calvinist uh, argumentation going on here. Um, I mean, no. I mean, I've I've studied a lot of religions. I mean, I, I've been raised in a I've been raised in a Christian family, but I mean, the closest thing I'll call myself right now would be um, okay. No, I actually don't want to talk about it. But um, no. Why, why would you not want to say? Well, I mean, if your position if your position's right, why don't you don't you want us to believe it? Well, because I think people have different ideas of what it is and what I have an idea of what it is. Okay, well, what's like, your idea of what it is? What is it, and what's your idea of it? Well, my idea of it is mainly, um, well, some people consider it satanic, but I don't think it is. Like um, hermeticism, like okay. I think that we are meant to um, transform ourselves into like. Mm-hmm good people in that sense because this idea of turning lead to gold means like mm. like from what i've read about it is you turn good no not good like you um this idea that through alchemy uh, personal alchemy so it's basically changing mm-hmm. personality you become good over time like mm-hmm. i'm still a layman i should read more about it okay, and what I is the think, good um well the good in that sense uh, I think it could relate a lot to the golden rule. Well, why is the golden rule the good? It sounds arbitrary. 
Well, well, hold on. So why isn't it Lex Talionis eye for an eye? Why is it the golden rule? Well, I mean, is there something that, is there like a good action that you would do that you wouldn't want done to yourself? You're asking me a question and I'm saying this is your view. So you tell me why the good is the golden rule and not Lex Talionis. Well, the goods, um, well, hmm. well, it's just, you know what, how about this? You think on it and then come back to the next stream and then I'll let you back on. Um, I've got to go to a Christmas Eve Western papal dinner tonight. So, but thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, not trying to be rude. I do have to leave. And I want to remind you guys to head on over to chog.com. Use promo code J50 to get 50% off. Tinfoil Hat Girl says for $5. I have a question. To, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see this until just now. Uh, you can go ask Father Ananias on Twitter. What is the relationship that we have to kids after we die and go into the eschaton? I've not had a good answer to this question. Well, I mean, what do you like? We're all you can ask him this, but I mean, we all have the same bodies in the resurrection. I don't think the resurrection is going to be people think that like, I'm not saying you say this, but people think heaven is like, we're all these sort of balls of, of ghost dust floating around and staring at ideas in heaven. No, no, it's a bodily resurrection. It's like Jesus came out of the tomb with a body. Same body that he had before. So we'll have a new heavens and a new earth with bodies and we'll move around and do stuff. Heaven isn't, heaven is the eschaton, new heavens, new earth. It's not like, it's like Eden was supposed to be. And it's the whole 